Welcome back to the State of the Arc podcast. My name is Mike. My name's Kason. This is the final episode of our Final Fantasy Tactics Analysis. Chapter 4. Dude, this game's ending is so good. <laughs> it's so freaking good. <laughs> I, I, um... I, it's weird, because I think this is the first game we've done where, like, we've had, like, maybe one major criticism of the story. I know, it's weird. <laughs> it's wild, it's wild, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is episode five, right? So, I, 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 I mean, there's, like, that one sequence going back to the Machine City. It just got clumsy and... and but it was just, that was it. That was it, yeah. And I don't know, I, I don't... I don't think I have... Like, Much by the way of criticism in terms of the story. Yeah. Here, I mean, there may be a little bit. That's but true. Mostly, in any, any four. complaints I might have come with the obtuse nature of the gameplay and exactly things exactly. like that, like the the systems and understanding them, or the way that they're tutorialized or not, or locking you into impossible to win battles on <laughs> accident yes. or things of that nature. Yeah, that kind of stuff. But with the story, I have basically no criticisms. It's like almost perfect story to me. It's very good. Very well done. We do have um, a section on the end of today's episode where we'll be addressing uh, people's questions, comments, mm -hmm. things yep. of that nature. So some people will probably bring up some things, or I know that they do, bring up yeah. some things, and uh, we'll discuss those. Okay. Um, but let's get through chapter four first. The opening scene has Oren returning home and talking to Sid. Um, and they're discussing the war and rumors and a little bit of formalities between them and things like that. The difficulty of finding evidence against the High Confessor in his conspiracy to uh, bring down the nobility of the church, you know, kind of take their place. Yeah. Um, Sid reveals, though, that he has one of the Arcite stones. He's holding one of them. He kind of pulls it out. Yeah. It does a little shine on it, right? A uh, little glimmer. So that's the opening scene. There's not much going on there, really, other than Sid is still loyal to Goltana, despite Goltana's uh, questionable handling of this war. Yeah. And that he has an Arcite stone. And that they're trying to find a way to implicate the church and failing. Is this where, um, is this where, is it Orlando who says this? That sooner or later they'll find out and then there will be real war? Yeah. 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 That's one, I love that line yeah. right there. Now it's probably a little different in War of the Lions, but as they're talking, it's just like, you, I, you, think I, this you is don't bad? know exactly what they're talking about, Yeah. but sooner or later they'll find out something. And then what's happening now is nothing. Yep. And we heard at the beginning of how chapter three. How bad it was. Three, chapter two. At the two. Of chapter two. Yeah, was, no, how bad it was. It was chapter three. This is four. Chapter yeah, three, three. Beginning of chapter three. And it's like, oh gosh, like they they are hiding things that are potentially like massive catalysts for the people, you know. Yep. Now, but it doesn't say what it is. I'm like, did they they'll find out the high priest plot or they'll find out Orlando's plot? Don't know. Find out about the the Kavi demons and the out of sight, maybe. I don't know. Um, Chapter 4, by the way, is titled Somebody to Love. Oh, right, yeah. Which I understood the other chapter titles <laughs> pretty well. Um, I sort of understand this one based on the end of the game, but yeah, I think it's not I what think, I thought I it was going to be. I think you're right. It's not what I, I think thought it was it's, um, it's related to Delita. And, yeah. um, well, I'm going to read a tweet from Matsuno okay. that I think will clarify this. Okay. Because uh, it's it kind of works into like the game's whole core theme about you know I've I've touched on it with the consequentialist thing, where it's like ends justify the means mm. or do they not? Do you uh, abandon your morality for the sake of accomplishing a task at any cost, or do you hold on to them? Yes. Yeah, uh, that's part of it. But like the second part of it is all embodied in Delita's question that he asks in like the final, yeah, well, final frame of the game. I right? took some notes on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think that that's where that kind of comes in, in more clear. So we'll we'll get into that later. But okay. Um, we really. So what's happening? We where we left off in chapter three is that Ramza has decided to go and find Delita and talk to him because he thinks. Oh, he's working for the church. He's being manipulated. 
Um, maybe yeah. he'll be able to give me key information that I need so that we can, you know, find out all the details we can about what the church's plans are, where all the Aura site is. We can collect that and put a stop to this. Mm -hmm. he, he needs to see Delita. So he's on his way there, but there's a couple of fights in between that. That for me, sort of like, as I took a break and they came back to it, you know, I took a break after chapter three, come back to it, I kind of forgot, like, where are we going? Right. <laughs> because it's like, you fight at Deguero Pass and it's a filler battle. There's like no story relevance to this. And then you just go. You go to the free city of Bernevia. Bernevia. Bernevia, Bernevia. Where you fight Isolude's sister. Yes. Um, and it's like, okay, she wants revenge because you killed, she thinks you killed. It's like a subplot, it's like right? a side, It's like, yeah. okay, I, I, by the time you fought those battles, yeah. it's like, wait a minute, where are we going? Oh yeah, we're going back, we're trying to find Delita Apparently. <laughs> with, with the Bravinia Free City though, I think it's, it was, th this might be a slight story criticism here. Sure. Uh, so Melia Dole is the sister of Islude, is that right? Yeah. Um, so she accuses us of killing Islude. Then the battle starts. Halfway through the battle, finally we react. Very slowly, but better late than never. Wait, I didn't kill Islu. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. We could have said that before we started killing these people, before all of this started happening, but halfway through, it's like, literally, it says, wait, come, as if he just realized, wait, what are you talking about? I didn't do that. Yeah. I love it. That's funny. Yeah, that she was. Does, she doesn't. Maybe could have been a little better done, but she does her little warp escape thing. Yeah, this is something that was interesting. That was brought up because um, somebody in the comments was saying they do this in Tactics Ogre as well, um. and part of this, well, in that game they have like these escape stones or whatever, um, mm -hmm. but part of it is that unit could have been killed on like any tile on the map, and so like planning them like running away from like any mm. point on the map would probably be more complicated than just disappear, <laughs> right? But so that kind of makes sense to me. It's like you can't necessarily plan. I guess you could script like no matter from where it is, like go to this exit or and maybe they, yeah, could, they just run around. You could create, um, you could create an animation where they like, the opacity goes off on them as they like walk to the next square and it just assumes they've run away or something like that. Oh sure, I've it. seen that done before. Yeah. But anyways, I did think it was an interesting point that they probably did this of, for just for convenience sake of like, yeah. I well, don't know clearly. where they're gonna be dead on, so yeah, they yeah. just disappear, right? Yeah. Anyways, she gets away. Then there's another battle at Finneth Creek. Um, but there's a, there's a new scene added here for the War of the Lions, so you probably didn't see this one, mm -mm. between Delita and, Tietra, or Delita and Ovelia. So he's standing up in a castle, and he's, he's like mourning or um, reminiscing or remembering Titra a little bit, and he's sad. And then he hears, uh, he's actually holding the pendant too, the pendant, Titra's pendant. Mm. Um, and he hears Ovelia trying to like, Oh. Use the grass flute and yeah, failing yeah. like brr, brr, like she can't get it right <laughs> brr, and he like looks down there and sees that and he, he he exits the castle and goes down and kind of shows her how to do it right um, and then then he finally explains to her uh, about Titra uh, he tells her what happened with Titra mm. and I really liked a line mm. here he says uh, she died for the nobility's convenience they used her and cast her away and for that I cannot forgive them. So this is really important, mm. not just for understanding Delita's motivation, which we pretty much have all the way through up to this point because we were there yeah. with him, but for also how it factors into the ending and from Ovelia's fear of the same thing. Uh, all the way back mm. in chapter two, when before we get to Lionel Castle and meet the Cardinal, she's saying, is he really gonna help us Will yeah, he just yeah. use me I like everyone else? Again, yeah. She has this real fear and resentment of being used by everybody. And Delita is saying <clears throat> that's the exact reason why he hates the nobility so much because of how they used his sister. Just keep that stuff in mind. Okay. <laughs> um, but anyways, it's a nice scene. They're getting closer. I, they, I, it's particularly in the War of the Lions version, there's a few more added scenes between Ovelia and Delita. And I think it's nice. It, like without those added scenes, it maybe can seem a little bit like 
you don't understand how that relationship blossomed into what it became. Yeah. Because um, it's just not on screen. But here they've added at least two or three scenes just between the two of them. And it's mm -hmm. been a really nice, like, gradual um, progression between them. And, uh, th you know, they're really getting closer. And <clears throat> uh, as you were saying last time when we were talking about Delita um, and, and how he's using Ovelia, right? Mm -hmm. He does actually have a genuine sense of love for her, which we're also going to see in the scene at the Zeltenia Castle um, between Delita and Ramza, which is a fantastic scene. Um, anyways, but in the end of this, he vows not to use Ovelia like Teacher was used, or not to allow them to do so, right? Yeah. So, nice little insert there. You get to Zeltenia Castle, finally. And this is a, a, one of those scenes that was <coughs> um, remade in the, the new art style, mm -hmm. hand-drawn art style for War of the Lions. I probably should have visited this one in the PS1 version, just looked at it, but I forgot to do that. So maybe you can just tell me what the differences are. Okay. But I copied down the whole thing. Because <laughs> <laughs> like every line is really good in this scene. And um, there's like a... There's like a really good sense of tension between Delita and, and Ramza here. It's like there, there's almost like a, a knife's edge oh, <laughs> sort yeah. of feeling to it. Is this in the church? It, yeah. Yes. Where yes. it's like yeah. they do still hold on to their old feelings of being best friends. Yes. Like that still exists. Yeah, there's an air of that. Yeah, but it's, it's like part of the atmosphere. But it's like, I will still kill you at any moment. I know, <laughs> and you know, and you know that. It's very yeah. clear, <laughs> specifically on Delita's end, it's very yeah. clear that when he asks us a question, it's not just a, hey, so what have you been up to lately? It's yeah. a, if you answer a certain way, I will kill you right now. Yeah. But... Have you been? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, yeah, yes. I've been good. So what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing this thing. But if you say the wrong thing, it's like he will he will kill so it's 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 a it's an interrogation, yeah. but that has this light air of like potential friendship that's like sitting underneath. It's yeah. it's fascinating. It's really, really well done. Yeah. And so Rams is there in the church, he's like praying. And yeah. Delita walks Oh, it's in. beautiful, by the way. Yeah. I love that shot. Yeah. Ch churches get me because they got the stained glass, especially in PS1 era. Yeah. The, like the, in Xenogears. And the window yeah, light Yeah, you always have the, the light beam shafts. You always have the um, the stained glass. You always have the organ and just the, the sets and candles and everything just looks. And in this game's no exception. It looks, it looks really cool. Yeah. So Delita comes in and says, a heretic at prayer in a church. Passing bold, <laughs> Ramza. <laughs> I love it. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> and Ramza uh, responds, I shall ask it plain. Why has the high confessor planted you amongst Goltana's men? So he just gets straight to the point. Right. Like, we know what, what you're doing. What is your involvement with yes. the church? Because now that he knows how bad the church is, he wants to know yeah, whether Delita like, knows it. Are you in on it? Exactly. Do you do you know what they're? Do you know about this Lukavi demon stuff or yes. not? <laughs> That's what he's really asking yeah. there, right? Because it's like if 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 you know that and you're still working with them, then I have to kill you. Then it's over. Yeah, <laughs> we're done. I hope that that's not true, but yeah. that's that's what I'm asking. I right? love that. So Delita uh, says, "I see no harm in telling you, Duke Goltana and Count Orlando. I am to assassinate them." Yep, both he just of says them. straight out. His that's his duty. Plot to assassinate yeah. them. And th this is part of where where you can tell the underlying friendship between the two of them. Right. Because. They're interrogating each other. They're asking each other really thin ice questions, but they are so freely offering a, an answer as if they trust each other. Yeah. So they trust each. It's it's crazy. <laughs> they trust each other, but they are on just like the edge of killing each other. Yeah. But but they trust, and and when it, when they give each other information, they can trust that it's true. And when they ask something that's difficult, they're like, well. I'll just tell you what yeah. I'm doing. And right. the, he, Delita is so secretive. He wouldn't tell anybody. But he'll tell Ramza. And like, anyways, it's so fascinating. This is the most dynamic kind of um, conversation. I would imagine if this was in a movie, it would be a very tense, very tense oh, yeah. scene. Yeah. Of just slowly mounting pressure. This is 
up there, probably in like my top three favorite scenes in the game. Yeah. Like Fort Zeekton's probably number one. This one's like maybe two or three, and then there's one mm. towards the end that's also oh, yeah. really good. But um, this scene is just, for the, all the reasons you just said, it's really, it's, really good. It's too good. This is um, <clears throat> what I wrote here. I think um, Delita thinks that a decapitation strike would result in less war. Because he also says something about how Larg will be killed at some point as well. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's all part of a plan, right? right? But his job is this one. And it's like, hey, kill the heads of all the people who are at war. And then... And then you will have peace. Yeah, because right? then the church can just yes. take over. I say interesting philosophy, but one I don't think would work well in the real world, <laughs> as he may be about to learn. We'll see. Yeah. The next ones in power are usually just as bad as the previous exactly ones. Exactly right. So it goes on to say, groups such as the Corpse Brigade, ill-contented with the crown and nobility, are in no short supply. So many more of those types of rebellions have risen up. Yeah. The church only fans rebellion's flame. The people tire of war and their disdain for the crown waxes with each passing day. And so, uh, let's see, he goes on to say, Of course, Goltana and Larg want to put down the rebellion at home. Only they lack the troops to do so. To break the impasse, they seek to bring an end to the, con to the conflict for good and all. Even as we speak, their armies mass at Fort Bessala to that purpose. So it's getting out of hand for yeah. the nobles who are like instigating this war. Like they're having trouble keeping down the rebellions in their own territories while fighting against their enemy, mm -hmm. trying to win the upper hand and scheme. It's, it's getting bad for them. Uh, and the church is just, whew, as he says, fanning those flames. Like, yes, fanning keep the going. flames. Yeah, because the church gains power when... Because someone has to always be in power. Yep. Someone will be in power. That's how people are. They look up to something to help lead them. Yeah. And as the nobility begins to drop in power, the church naturally is in the position to, to rise up right. and say, we will be your authority. Right. So Ramza says, in these months of rebellion and unrest, it all goes as the high confessor had planned. And Delita says, yes, but it will not end as they have hoped. Larg and Goltana will be assassinated once the battle begins. So, like, like you said, the plan here is, he goes on to say, cut off one head yep. and two more spring forth. So naturally, their closest allies must die with them. So the plan here is so to kill, kill more than Goltana just, and yeah. Orlando yes. of the southern sky. And then also Larg, but Zalbag and Dicedard Dice of the northern yeah. sky. Kill all of them so that like there's no more right. of these people who are bad in leadership to take their place when it's all said and done. Yes. So his part of the plan, like you're saying, is to assassinate Orlando and Goltana. Orlando and Goltana. Um, with their leaders gone, the fighting will cease and they will have no choice but to embrace the peace See, we offer. See, that's where he's being an idealist. But Ramza's response to that yeah. is perfect. A peace or a surrender on the church's terms. There you go. Just go to the next, because when you say, oh, you you can't just kill the leader, you have to also kill the people underneath the leader who will then assume power. Yep. But he's leaving the church out of the <laughs> equation, which is like, yes. no, no, the next one you need to assassinate is the next one that will take power, which is the church. But here's the thing, you're going to slowly just go down the line killing every Everybody. every next hundredth person who's about to take power, you know, uh, what do they call it, the, the line of... Succession, succession. Yeah. yeah. You'll just go down the line and eventually you'll kill a thousand people and then the thousand and one person will then assume the throne and keep the war going. <laughs> it's just how it works. <laughs> but he's, he's ignoring the church's role, which is interesting, yep. very revealing, I think. It says, the people will proffer to the church, this is Delita speaking, mm. the people will proffer to the church the role of mediator with hands upraised. What's yes. more, the church will have the Zodiac Braves. So he does know at least about the Aura site and the Zodiac Braves side of it. Which okay. Isolude also knew, but he didn't realize he didn't the know demon everything. plot. Yes, exactly, yeah. He so just this doesn't completely yeah. implicate Delita True. yet. Because the, the fact that he says Zodiac Brave mean he, that's re a reference to the legend, the not legend. necessarily the power itself. Right. And according to the legend, the stones are good. So it's like, okay, he doesn't maybe know everything yet, so we'll see. And then he makes what I think is one of the most tense lines of dialogue mm, it's here. It's my next note. Yep, right, yep, which yep. is, one thing yet remains between the church and the Arasite, the heretic Ramza Baal. And that is you. And it's like, uh-oh, are they going to throw down right here? I know, it's <laughs> wild. 
It's wild. Um, in the PS1 <laughs> version, it says, right now, okay, way less poetic, but yeah. more direct. Right now, you're the church's biggest obstacle, Yeah, is the line. And it's like, it's so funny, because you, you feel the tension of the scene, but and you think, this is tense, we're about to kill each other. But then this line's delivered, and yeah. you're like, oh, this, it, like, it just got more intense <laughs> it just went somehow. Up even more. Because yeah, you already up. know that they're like this, but now what you've learned here is that Delita is executing plans for and on behalf of the church, mm -hmm. and the church is, and he'll do whatever. He's going to kill people because the church is like, hey, go kill these people. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then he says, oh, by the way, the church also wants you dead. Yep. And Ramza's and response. I will kill whoever the church tells me to kill. Yeah. <laughs> Ramza's, like, Ramza's response to that <laughs> is really great yeah. because Delita's whole freaking thing this whole time has been no one tells me what to do anymore. Yes, yes. I yes. blaze my own trail. Right. I am doing it my own way. I don't serve anyone else. Because that's what he says to Algus. Like at the end of uh, chapter one, that battle, he, was like, mm. uh, he says, No man. Something like no man will tell me what to do or when ever again kind of a thing. It was something along those lines, right? And then Algus takes off his helmet and says, I'm no man. <laughs> and then s kills him. Okay, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, so Ramza's uh, response to that is, is that it? You've come to fetch the Arasite for your masters? This is triggering. <laughs> yes, this is triggering. Ramza. Okay, sure. It pisses him off. He's I am like, no hound it? healing at the church's skirts. I answer to no one but myself. Right, but it yep. doesn't seem that way. So it's Ramza like, no. says, meaning what? <laughs> yeah. Right? And Dulita says, meaning I would not think twice of killing you, Ramza, should the hour come, but not this day. Though our methods be different, our goals are not. As long as they remain so, you are no enemy of mine. And that diffuses the situation. Yep. That's the point where it's like, oh, God, okay. <laughs> but still, yeah. like, how, how intense is that? I'm not um, going to kill you just because they want you dead. Yeah. Because as of right now, you are fighting the same people I am fighting. Yes. So therefore, I will let you live. Yes, but should that change, realize yes. I'm the one, not them telling me, I am the one who will want to kill you at that point. Right, it's not because they told me to do it. <clears throat> Yeah. And and you do it, it. It does turn out to be something less of what Ramza accuses Delita of. He is still planning his own thing here. Yeah, like he's doing what the church tells him to do. In part, the the reason he's not going to kill the church is the same reason he's not killing us. Yeah, it's like well, we have a common enemy at the moment. So the foresight of yeah, but then the church will take power. He's okay with that at the yeah. moment because he's like, well, I'll deal with that when it happens. Yeah. And then I have no issues with taking the church down as well. Exactly. So, and then at that point, uh, he's walking out like he's, Delete is leaving the cathedral. Mm. <clears throat> and Ramza kind of calls out to him and says, let us fight this together. Like, come on, like, yeah. there's no reason why we like should Like old be, times. There's no reason why we should, there should be any hint between us of being enemies. There's no yeah, reason yeah. for this. Let's just do this together. Right. Delita says, I cannot join you. She needs me far too much yes. to leave her now. She and Rums is like the princess, so he's speaking about Ovelia. And Delita says, Prince or princess, the church cares not, it craves only power. Um, a puppet state with the high confessor at its strings, this is their grand plan for Ibali. So he admits that he understands what the church is doing here. Yes. He's like, they're trying to be the, the, the ones pulling the strings now, right? Mm hmm. And so that's why he, he can't leave Ovelia, because of how they would use her for that, right? So Ramza says, and you? Do you not use Ovelia to fulfill your own ambitions? Yeah. A very good and pointed question. It's a good question, but the answer is even better. Yep. The answer is like a very good answer. Delita says, I cannot say, yep. I'm sure only of this. To save her life, I would gladly give my own. That is so revealing, but so interesting, <laughs> yeah. so interesting. Yeah. So he's willing to do whatever it takes, except he has found a person to whom he would give all of that up, yep. or for whom he would give all of that up. Yep. And that just doesn't, I, you don't really see that coming in his character or throughout this conversation up until that point, but it's very revealing. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote this up here when he says, she needs me, that Delita is becoming a monster to fight the other monsters, which is, perhaps um, the reason why 
the next boss is always as bad as the previous one because in order yeah. to take down the boss, you have to become the monster, and then you're in power, and then, mm -hmm. well, you're a monster, just like he was, or she. Uh, but it's entirely unclear that he will become evil. See, this is the thing. What, once he gives these lines and stuff, I'm, I'm reading this, I'm watching the scene, and I'm like, initially I'm thinking, we're going to slowly watch Delita's descent into monstrosity, and we're going to watch his character become the evil that he's trying to fight against, right? Yeah. The Anakin Skywalker line, right? Um, and But w once this happens, it just becomes unclear at this point in the story. It's like, okay, I'm pretty sure that I knew what we were seeing with him, but this just kind of threw everything into, into question now. Mm -hmm. Like, he's clearly going down a, a, a strange path, but now I'm curious where that will put him. It was so easy to see in chapter three and chapter two where he was going and yeah. what he was going to become and how he was not likely to make it out of this alive yeah. because he is in way over his head and he's playing the same game they are. Yeah. And, and either he'll be killed by them or he'll succeed in killing them only to become the new monster that we kill. The game so of, it's like the game of he's Thrones, going dude. to die. Exactly. <laughs> he's playing the game. And, and it's not a game that ends well for almost anybody, right? right. But at this point, when he reveals that there is another purpose that drives him to do what he's doing, um, it becomes less clear exactly where he'll end up in the end. Mm. So every, it all just gets really foggy for me. And at that point, I'm like, okay, I don't actually know where he'll end up because there is a point where he would draw the line yeah. and say, I will sacrifice myself for this. Yes. And that's what... Dice Star wouldn't, wouldn't do. do no. <laughs> That's what you know. A lot of these other characters were dealing with. We're dealing with. They would not do that. Um, but Delete has just said, "I will." There is some way that I would lay down my own life willingly. Yeah, I think that he reached that point, that threshold that he mm. couldn't cross. Yeah. In the scene we talked about last time, where he was mocking Ovelia uh, very cruelly, yes. and she yes. called him out on it, and he sort of realized, "What am I doing?" Right. Like, how far have I really gone here? This is not me. This is not, and he, he sort of softens yeah. there for the first time. Yeah. In the whole, since chapter one, he's like not being this like cold, harsh, cruel person. For the first time, he actually opens up his heart a little bit. And it was mm -hmm. all because of her. So he's still capable of love. He still wants, he still desires that. But he's, he's in conflict between that and his ju ends justify the means mentality. Yes. And these two things are starting to butt heads here. Exactly. So once they butt heads, w when you just see the one side of it, you're like, I know where this is going. Yeah. As soon as an obstacle comes in front of that, y how is he going to get around it or is he, what's he going to do? Like it just, right. it clouds everything. Yeah. Um, which is good because you don't always want to know exactly how a story is going to end, right? Right. Um, yeah, to save her life, I would gladly give my own. You must think this strange. Ramza says, no, I understand only too well. Um, and then you hear mm. uh, Zalmor from outside. I oh. address the heretic Ramza Baeov. You are oh, besieged. Great. You will surrender yourself to us at once. They're outside. And he's like, oh, I know that voice. That's Confessor Zalmor. Runs to the door and uh, goes outside and... Delita kind of follows him. So they end up fighting together here because yes. Delita doesn't yes. want the confessor to report that he's been here. Yes, with when they were together. Ramza. Exactly. He's like, he's seen me. He can't live now. And isn't this the point where we're like, well, hold on. We don't yes. have to kill the guy. He's like, they don't know. <laughs> and this is important. And Delita's like, no, I'm not compromising yeah. my goal for a what if maybe he's innocent. Like, I don't, right. that's not good enough. For exactly. Him. But, but Ramza says something here that I think is really interesting, which is these people are not aware of the Lukavi demon uh, part yes, of this. Yes, yes, yes. Um, part of my uh, debate that I remember with some people, which we covered last time, so if you're not aware of that whole thing, just go watch the last episode. Mm. Um, one of the things we, we argued about was he was saying everybody in the church is shown to be like an, an amoral, bad person, like every church leader, whether it's an right. elder or a confessor or a bishop or whatever, they're all bad. Mm -hmm. And I think that this line is revealing because Ramza is admitting that's not the case. First of all, Elder Simon wasn't a bad person. He did a bad thing in 
ignoring the corruption right. yeah. for so that he could keep his library and keep Some learning. Books, yeah. Um, but he wasn't a bad person, and right. in the end, he did the right thing. Yeah. Uh, but the the admission here is that Confessor Zalmar is not aware of this. Isolude, who was mm -hmm. one of the Knights Templar, didn't realize right. what his father was it. doing. So That's there's true. many people in the church here who do not understand. They're not bad people. Right. They their faith has has kept them on this side, mm -hmm. but they're not aware of the fact that the church has been infiltrated. It's not being led from the beginning by yeah. Lukavi demons. Yeah, it's yeah. been taken over by them. They've been recently right. possessed <laughs> because mm -hmm. the Aura site was found. So anyways, that's an interesting point is that Ramza is trying to say, we don't have to kill these people. We can talk to them. They're not aware of what it is that they're doing and who they're following. And Dulita's like, you're free to try, but like, mm -hmm. that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to work. And he's right. You have to kill them. Yeah. So, yeah. You end up uh, fighting that battle, and then uh, they have a short conversation at the end. Ramza and Delita do. There's a new character introduced here, Valmafra, who um, oh yeah yeah uh, is a woman who was sent by the church to keep an eye on Delita yes. and make sure he does the yeah. things that they're telling him to do. Which we don't know that till later, but at the niche initially, yeah, she just, she's yeah. just kind of following him very closely. She's yeah. very close with him, but it seems like she's his right hand. You know. Yeah. Is like, like you're, a, this is my my assistant, whatever. Yeah. This is the person who comes with me and who I trust a lot. Mm -hmm. And he says that initially. She shows up, and we're like, "Who's this girl?" And he's well, like, "We can trust." He her. does. He does. Yeah. He says she's with me. Right. Um, but they do mention that she's here to watch me. Right. But ah, it, I see. Okay. But like, they don't say from what side, whether it's a church. It just she's keeping her eye on me. Well, maybe I missed that because to me it was a bit of a reveal later on when I think it is still surprising. Else happens. Right. It, that scene is still surprising because it's like, oh, she's like willing to go that far right. in it. I, I thought that their relationship might have made up for that. Like they learned to trust each other and got on the same page friends. or something, and and saw the same goal together, but. But she really is here just to watch Delita mm. and like make sure he doesn't step out of line. Um, I don't think this has happened yet, right? Uh, he hasn't been put in charge of the Southern Sky Knights by Goltana yet, right? Was that at the end of chapter I three? I think it actually, no, it's not until Orlando. Okay, okay so that's okay. coming up. Cool. Anyways, <clears throat> they talk about where they're going to go next, yeah, yeah. what they're going to try to do. Uh, Ramza wants to try to stop the battle from happening. They're going to have a huge battle between Southern Sky and Northern Sky. Mm. A bunch of people are going to die. This is where Delita is going to assassinate Orlando and Sid. Yeah. And where Larg and Dice Darg and Zalveg are going to be assassinated. All at this big battle is going to happen. Ramza is going to try to stop that battle from ever happening and turn the whole tide of this and the, the, get in everybody's way. Yeah. <laughs> stop everybody's plan from proceeding and try to get them to see you're fighting the wrong people. Yeah. You're all being manipulated. It's, it's, it's the cardinal who's dead, who I killed, but it's those people <laughs> yeah. who are really manipulating this. There's Lukavi demons and the Arasite plot here. This is what we really need to be fighting against, right? That's kind of his mindset here. And Delita is going to do what he was tasked to do. And he's like, he, he wishes him luck in his attempt. Delita wishes Ramza luck in his attempt to thwart all of this, but... Yeah. Doesn't really believe he can. No, do it. he's like, I'm gonna go do my thing. If your thing works, sweet. If yeah. not, um, we're good. Valmafra had a line here that I that I thought was really great because when when Ramza leaves and uh, w walks out of frame, um, she says, "Even your friends are only pieces to be played." To to Delita. Yeah. And he gets really mad at that. He's he like, does. He's like, he's "Be quiet! Upset. Like you don't know what you're talking about." Yeah. But this is. I mean, we're seeing this but over and over. But she's kind of right. That's exactly what Delita <laughs> and he is doing. Hates it. He hates, he it. hates that yeah. he is becoming exactly what he was fighting against in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. He he said it earlier to Ovelia. I cannot forgive them, the nobility, for how they used my sister. Mm. But now all he's doing is using his friends. Yep, yep, yep. And everyone around him, and even the girl he loves, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's using all of them to an end. And he's he doesn't like to hear that. Yeah. And he doesn't like to hear that he's 
you know, uh, that, that his, the church is his master. These are all things that he rejects, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's, it's what's necessary. It's the, it's the, the, uh, the means mm -hmm. <laughs> to the end that he is justifying. Right. So he's allowing and himself. that'll carry him, yeah. He's allowing himself to indulge in all of those things that he hates in order to reach an end that will yes. be better. And that's, that's like the great, what, the, the binary like choices that the two of them make. The opposite, yeah. the opposition in I'm going and justify the means for Delita, yeah. but not for Ramza. Right. And it's like the two competing ideas and, and mm -hmm. we, we get to see kind of how they both play out. Right. So um, this was so interesting. After, after talking, these two, Delita and Ramza, best friends since youth, torn apart by the cruel nature of the world, come together and clasp hands oh, briefly. Right. Mm -hmm. They just shook hands, and it was it was yep. it was so interesting. That stuck with me for whatever reason. But they didn't do that earlier. In their yeah. previous encounters, they were very wary of each other, yeah. and they kept a distance yeah. a bit. Um, but yeah, here they shake hands. So I wrote here: it's like they're slowly getting to know and respect each other more and more throughout the game, and are slowly becoming friends again, albeit in a more professional way. I didn't yeah. know the word. What's the word? Professional may not be the right word. I know what you mean. But there's but a I, word. Yeah, it's like something. they're friends in a not friend way. <laughs> in a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a contemporary or like a, like a colleague. Or yeah, like, like a, a, more of a colleague. A respected, um, maybe like a respected rival in another organization. That's or it. They're like gaining that. respect for each other yeah. in, in their new modes that are yeah. different from when they were kids, you know? Um, so I wrote here, it's like Delita said he would kill us, but he's also eager to patch things up and trust us in yeah. some way. It's really hard to explain, and I don't really understand it yet, <laughs> but the picture says a thousand words of them shaking hands and of them actually physically touching, you yeah. know, and, and just being closer. You know, yeah. it, sa it says what I can't, and which is a lot, you know, at least for yeah. that moment. Um, but then she shows up and says Delita just uses people and he gets so pissed. So <laughs> he he is conflicted yet resolute. He probably hates himself. He may consider himself as, in have, as having already died, which is something yeah. we brought up last episode. Mm -hmm. um, but this is kind of where I first started thinking of that, where it's like, it's almost like he's a, he's a ghost of himself, you yeah. know, that's going out and autonomously doing the things that that he thinks he wants to do, but that it's not what he really wants to do. But right. this, the zombie, that the ghost that possesses his flesh is <laughs> forcing him to do this thing, you know? Yeah. And he's just, it's so interesting. It's so conflicting for him. So Delita is fascinating. He's the most fascinating character. I, I don't know. I'm not sure I've ever seen a character quite like him in a game. He's so conflicted and monstrous, but gentle and kind yeah. and strong-willed. And it all works together though, right? He's full of faith and hate and anger and love <laughs> and he's completely this is so funny he's full of love but he's also cold and calculating mm. right he's so passionate yet empty and devoid of emotion yeah. but but it makes sense in some weird way he feels more real because of that you yes. know and i don't know him very well but in a sense me not understanding his character all that well um lends towards the realism of his character even more. More yeah. so than any other character in the game. And more so than most other characters I've probably experienced in any art form yeah. anywhere. Like, it, it, he feels very, very incredibly real. And part of that realness is my inability to actually understand him. And I don't know how to pull that off artistically necessarily. <laughs> That's a great feat, I think. Um, many people would try and you'll just end up making an unrelatable character. Yeah. Uh, but this character's perfectly relatable, but he's not very, you, you, you don't know him all that well, despite um, relating to him in certain and, ways. And, and that's it's in fascinating, big, it's that's so well done. In big part, that's because Ramza's our point of view character. Yes, and he's a straight arrow, we, he's yeah. the Harry Potter, Every uh, always makes the right choice, the never wants to hurt anyone. The, yes. I, the ideal hero character. Clearly, with yes, very much so. Basically his only fault being that he's naive. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's about it. Yeah. Like and that's why he he's too try he's too nice. Delita, his, his fault is he's too nice. <laughs> if Delita you call that a fault, is the more interesting character. Much more so, yeah. Because and this is something I've talked about on an on an old podcast. I don't remember which one. A long time ago, a couple years ago, I think. Um, what makes stories interesting, right? 
is conflict. Like yes. Conflict is yep, at yep, the yep. center of making anything interesting. Yeah. Um, we, I think it was the episode where we were talking about escapism. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, there's a place for escapism. Escapism is kind of seen as like this bad thing. It's not. Mm -hmm. um, you need it as a way to unwind and relax and just right. like fulfill a fantasy in your mind kind of a thing, sure, right? Sure. And there's definitely a place for that. But in, in storytelling, if you want something that has like real impact, um, you have to have conflict. And so yeah. in Delita's case, there's tons of internal conflict here. So much. So much conflict and, inside of and it. And well understood. The conflict is well understood. Yeah. In so few words. Yes. And you get so much out of the small amount, these short cutscenes, that you understand all of his conflict. But it doesn't feel like some smorgasbord of, well, he's got this problem and this problem and this problem and this problem and throw him out there and now he, this is what the audience, you know, has to absorb. Like, whoa, this guy, like, I, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, that's yeah. not what's happening here. It's completely the opposite of that. Exactly. It was very slowly done. It was a slow build up. And part of that, part of why I think humans gravitate so much towards story is because it, it makes things palatable for us. And so you'll, instead of just being fed information all at once, a story allows for progression, which means you slowly get the knowledge necessary by the end of the story to understand exactly why the climax and other things have to happen or why it happens the way that it does. Yes. But the slow feed of information is what keeps us interested and is what allows us to eventually create and construct a an accurate metaphor for, you know, whatever the artist is trying to convey. Mm -hmm. and that it, you you story is the best way to do that you can't just tell someone everything <laughs> right and and the, crafting a character like this it's a gradual feed of information and it's just it was masterfully done it's exactly what tetsuya takahashi said about oh, yeah. how do i share all these thoughts i have about religion and philosophy and oh yeah psychology about you, how much I he hates just... christians <laughs> 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 just kidding that clearly wasn't what he said out to do. i can't just say this to yeah. the youth of the world. Exactly. They won't listen to me. Exactly. So I have to make a metaphor yes. in the form of storytelling to, you know, sort of get that those points across. And that's how all anything, anything you do basically needs a story around it for you to do it. Yeah. <laughs> whether that story's you or whether you're making it up or whether you're being told the story. It doesn't, almost doesn't matter. Like humans need a story in order to act in the world. Yeah. It is, it is just how we're programmed. Right. Now all of this is not to say, because I have a feeling some people might be typing at this point. It's not to say that Ramza has no conflict or no internal conflict as no, a character. No, he does. He does. He certainly does. The difference between them is that, and, and uh, this is really hard to articulate, but I'll do the best I can. Um, Delita watched his sister who he was very close to. Yeah. They were orphaned together. They were taken in together. They trusted House Beolv together. They yeah. were betrayed together. He watched her die in his arms, right? Mm -hmm. This was a horrifically tragic, traumatic event that he has to contend with because that creates real, deep resentment and hatred, right? Yeah. And that's not the kind of feeling you want to act on. Mm, right. right, true, true. But true. how can you blame one for doing so? Right. That, you that's the you can't. huge And that's where the human element, that's where him. it feels real. Right. So yeah. it's like Delita doing what he does, we can all sit here and say it's wrong. Right, of course. But we can't blame him no. for doing it. Not if you really if do you, some soul searching if in you yourself. If you understand yeah. what, tra what trauma does, yeah. in here to people. Mm -hmm. It's harder to blame them for what they do. Now that being said, Ramza's side of things is, it's still pretty intense. His family ends up being the opposite of the ideas he holds. Right. The difference is that he's not that close to Dice Dark. Right. Or he's, he seemed to be a lot younger than them. And a, he's close with Alma. Yes, yes. And he's actually closer with Delita than he is mm -hmm. with, say, <coughs> Dice Dark. Yeah. So he has to contend with this, uh, this, this reputation of, um, of the noble knight devout that his father left for their house. Mm. And that his, the fact that his brothers are betraying that. And the fact that he loses his station in the world. Right. But none of that is as important to him as 
being um, just. So it's easier for him to let that stuff go. It's easier for him to fight his own brothers. Mm -hmm. It's easier for him to contend against those things because his most important motivating, driving characteristic is I have to live up to the nobility the of honor. my father. Yeah and the honor of my father. Mm. That's most important to him. Now, what happens with Alma being captured, let's say Alma had been killed, then we'd be then talking he'd something be a more very interesting. different. Yes. Oh, right? yes, yes. So it's not, it's not really comparable. What Delita is having to contend with internally is so mm. much stronger, yeah, it's so yeah. much harder to resist, yeah. and Ramza has a much easier time mm -hmm. making the right choices. Because he has not lost what is most important to him in all of that. He still maintains it. He's fighting to maintain it. Delita lost it. Mm. And so that's what I really love about stories like this. And it's a big part of the reason why I love the Witcher stories so much. Mm. Um, and why, in part, I don't love some of the things they did in the show. I like stories where they present moral questions of this kind. Right, like what is moral, what is right? Is this good or bad or something like that? Who, right. Is this person in the right or in the wrong? Mm -hmm. And the characters contend about that, they debate yeah. about that. But the story never passes judgment on the character. Right. What it does is it shows that everybody has weaknesses and flaws. We are all exceptionally flawed people mm -hmm. and were we in that position, can we really say that we wouldn't do the same? And it makes you Think about that. It makes you question your own ideas about morality. And it doesn't try to say, oh, see what this person did? Look how awful that is. That's inexcusable. Yes. That's too easy. It is. That's too easy. And that also, that's where you get into the dangerous realm of like what maybe some Christian people would be upset about this game, where it's like, well, this game didn't do that though. Yeah. Sometimes somebody's like, oh, I want to pass judgment on Christianity. I'm going to explicitly right. do that. That's not what Matsuno did at all. Mm -hmm. it, but if somebody did do that, and it was so explicit, as you're saying, that's just that's not artistic. It's right. not as creative. It doesn't um, evoke the emotional empathy that you want to have in your metaphor, you know? And this is why the ending of the game is so powerful. Uh, because yeah. you can't just hate Dolita and think mm -hmm. of him as a villain at the end. You Gosh. can't do and that. And well, we're going to get there, but what he <laughs> does is just like, it almost, how, it's so bad. Yeah, it's so bad. <laughs> it's so bad, but you just feel bad for him. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't hate him. It's fascinating. And that takes, that takes a, a well-crafted story to do that. Um, because any other way that you present Delita's actions will immediately, you would pass judgment on them immediately. Yes. As being very immoral. Yes. Um, but having the context of his entire situation and then viewing things, you know, yeah. such as that, you're just like, you can't, you can't pass judgment as right. easily. And that's, that's, that's the type of story generally that I like best. Yeah. One that shows humans for what they are. Yeah. Exceptionally flawed. So much. And so many holes yes. in, and bias that yeah. clouds your own understanding of the world and of your own actions and morality and demonizing those who oppose you mm -hmm. and how easy it is to do all of that to justify yourself, to justify your position without seeing your own flaws, without seeing uh, the moat in your own eye, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, so to speak, yeah. Right? Yeah. But not passing judgment on people for that because we all do it. Yeah. And were you put in that situation with that person's life, with that person's Dude, problems yes, and, yes. and trauma, would you not do the same? Right. You, and the fact that it can make you question that for a minute, the empathy and the humanity and being able to look at people in this light and not just judge them and dismiss them is to me the best kind of storytelling that there yeah. is, because that's what the point of it is. It's to understand yeah. one another. See, that's art that can make a difference. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that's one aspect of all of this that I love so much about Final Fantasy Tactics. The way that D uh, Delita's character as, as a whole arc is really handled. It, it leaves you with that feeling. 
Um, anything else on no, that scene? No, I think okay. we got that. The next battle's at uh, Bedtha Waste. Bedtha Waste? Bed Desert, you mean? Bed Desert. <laughs> <laughs> War of the Lions. <laughs> much better. <laughs> oh my god. Much better name there. Oh my gosh. Not all the name changes are great. I like Algus. Bed but, Desert. No. But, but Bed Desert's pretty bad. Yeah, um, bad. Here you fight against Barak. I think this is the first time we see Barak. He's a Knight oh, Templar. Okay, it's Bulk. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> every <laughs> single, every no, single the, time there is a question about L or L R, R it's they like, get it pff, wrong. wrong. They way. reverse it. That is so funny. That is Bulk. insane. I've never seen it <laughs> that many times yeah, yeah. confused. You would think that at least 50-50, right? It's, 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 it's like literally 90-10 yeah. percent of yeah, the time. That's way too much. What the fuck? Anyways, he's a Knight Templar. And what they're doing is they're spreading a poison on the wind that will go down into where yeah. the battlefield is and will like poison all the soldiers. And it's a spore, it's like a fungus. Yeah, it's from a mushroom. Yeah. Um, this is where, around the point here, this is where Delita gets promoted. Yeah. And becomes the leader. Right, because, um, so the idea is to poison Larg's army, which will draw Gotana's army in to finish them off. And right, because they're weakened. where they'll the church is going to swoop in and like yeah. cut off all the heads. And like kill Goltana saying, right? and then, yeah. So that's the plan that he reveals that they're doing. You fight him, but he's already done it, right? So it's like, oh, we got to rush in there and like put an end to this or warn somebody, right? Yeah. Then we see the, see you're, the scene you're talking about where Goltana has lost faith in Orlando and Sid and um, basically arrests him. Um, yeah, that seems fascinating. Yeah. Um, It's, I do like that there was a, there was a setup where you can tell Goltana was not loving Sid's advisorship role anymore. Yeah. Um, once war starts, you don't want the person around telling you how bad war is and how much right. you shouldn't have done this, right? Right. Once you make your decision as an executive authority, as a king, whatever, you, um, you need someone like Orlando, but you don't want them. You right. want just the people who are with you. It's like, are you with me? It, either you get on my team or get out. Yeah. And that's basically what he's doing here. And Sid's like, you know, I'm team peace. What can I say? And so Goltan has got no choice. He's like, then right. I need a new second in command because you're not cutting it. Right. And so, yeah, he, he's... But uh, he goes so far as to arrest him. And there's a, there was a, um, a rumor, what was it, about Orlando that he's plotting a rebellion or something. Right. Like, clearly, probably seated by Delita, right? Right. But Delita's he's pretty powerful, man. He's convincing <laughs> a lot of people of a lot of things. He could slay that dude he in Goltana's court. He walked into Goltana's <laughs> court for the first time, Kay. killed one of his advisors, and is now... His basically is now basically becoming in, in charge of his army. Yeah, after and I don't know exactly how much time passes. I guess it depends on the game how many things you go and do because yeah, it's days a day you've per, walked around. But it's like a month or two, a couple months maybe. Probably. Um, but I did have a question about this after finishing the game and seeing that it didn't quite answer this. That advisor he slew mm -hmm. was that actually was that advisor actually a. Plotting against Goltana? I don't know the um, Or did Delita just make the whole thing up and just to kill him? I don't know the canonical answer to this. Okay. Uh, maybe it's left up to interpretation a little bit. The way well, it came across to me yeah. in the scene was that they were, the, the writer, Matsuno, was leading you to believe at first that this was true. Yes. But then by the end of the scene, it was like, wait a minute, maybe he actually had not done that at all. Right. Maybe this was just a, 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 um, a means to justify the ends kind of a thing. And so, and so that he could make a splash and yeah. get things moving, right? right? By the end of the game, I'm almost positive that that's what it was. Yeah. That that was Delita basically just doing whatever it took, you yes. know? Just, and I don't know, I guess somebody could help us out in the comments, but my, my gosh, Delita, <laughs> like that is, that <laughs> yeah, is intense. It's, it's, Nothing gets in his way. He's going all in. He's completely committed to this path. Yeah, it's right? wild. And then he gets um, Orlando taken down. Yep. And so, yeah, uh, Goltana in the scene by the end sort of makes him the, the head of the Southern Knights, the Order yep. of the Southern Knights. And so he's the one who's going to be in charge of, like, leading the, the, the battle coming up against the North and South at Bessala. Yeah. 
So I did have another note here, just a brief note, that uh, Delita reminds me a bit of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who was a peasant but grew to rule all of Japan. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't he from that southern tribe? What are they called? Uh, anyways. Oh, there was a name. I know what you mean. I can't remember. Um, he was part of Nobunaga. He was with yes. Oda Nobunaga. Yes. And then he, he became afterwards... And yes. he was one of the people that helped this was unify the war, all of Japan. This was the war that yeah, were directly um, led to the events of um, Shogun. Shogun. The f- oh, they that They changed game. the names, yeah. or the, the book Shogun. Uh, oh, not, I thought you meant the game. Not the game it's Shogun. around the games around that time too, right? I think so. But anyways, uh, the book Shogun changes the name, so they're fictional names. Oh, really? But it's based in that time, right after that guy rose, became Shogun, and then died. And uh, then they decided who's going to be the next. Okay, yeah. And they have like a council, yep, right, yep. and all that stuff. Anyways, I know who you're talking about. I forget his name. Yeah, so. Or the tribe he came from. Yeah, I can't remember the tribe. There was, there was like seven different groups, right? And he was, yeah. he was part of one of them. Um, but he joins with um, Nobunaga. And anyways, he becomes a peasant to, to like the leader of all of Japan. Yeah. In just the span of his lifetime, basically. Yeah. Yeah, they don't even know where he was born because he was just a nobody. Yeah, and his dad was a nobody, and, and they don't he know who did any of this some stuff was. Fetch oh up yes, stuff. <laughs> which you have to do. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, Delita's character may have actually been loosely based a little bit on uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi. I don't have any basis for saying that officially, but it seems to line up a little bit, like yeah. a peasant that ba- probably was a bit of a psychopath and basically became Nobunaga's like number two guy. Yeah. Like, that was crazy. And then when Nobunaga died, Hideyoshi becomes the leader of all of Japan. Right. And it's it's just a, it's a fascinating story. It's fascinating. Yeah. But I just wanted to mention that. Yep, that's, that's a good it. thing to uh, to mention there. Um, so Fort Besala is the next. There's a, there's a couple of battles here. This is, yeah, there's another, like, sequence yeah. of several battles. But um, so the air is befouled. Knights are laying dead all around the field. Zalbag enters the scene. He's like, oh my gosh, like what's happening? Oh, he yeah. Finds, he finds yep. Dice Darg, who then goes up to Larg, and Larg is poisoned. And, you know, Larg is, es- is essentially saying he's, he's not going to die. He thinks he'll make it if he can just, you know, be taken to an apothecary, like, right away. Yes. And Larg says, that's too bad. And then stabs him. <laughs> no, um, not was it Larg? You Larg. mean um, you oh, mean no, sorry, Zal- Dice Dark. or Dice Stark? Yes, Dice Stark stabs Larg. Dice Stark's like that's too bad. Just like a slow, <laughs> a slow just like a nice shunk, insertion. And Larg's like, what the heck? Zalbag, he did not yeah, see it like, Oh, Zalbag too. Yeah, yeah, he's like, what are you doing, man? Yeah. And Dice Stark's like, hey, man, dude, just tell the people that he died. That someone else did. Pick pick one of our soldiers, make them the scapegoat, yep. and say that oh, we caught a spy, and that's who killed him. Yep. And, and Zalbag's like, what the heck? But it's what like, dude, on? you're in it now. You're a witness. What are you going to do? Like, you, we're, we're in this together now, you know? But the, the real telling thing here was that Larg, it, with his dying breath, mentions out loud that Dice Darg killed his own father. Yes. Yep, yep. He and said, oh, you would, of course you would do this. You did it to your own yeah. father. How, how could I have not ex- yes. you know, expected someone who killed his own father to have done this. And then Zalbag heard this, right? He does. Yes, and because he goes to investigate later, which we'll get he to. He doesn't want to believe he it. He doesn't, no. Right now. Yeah. But this is, but I mean, that's a shocking thing to hear. And yeah. <laughs> Dice Dark is at least capable of this. Clearly. <laughs> I, I do question, I mean, it was a decent opportunity for Dice Dark to do that, I suppose, uh, because all the soldiers were down, and mm. it's like, well, this is... This is a good time for him to die. Yes. So I'll just make it happen. The only issue is that Zalbeg was there. But um, I, he could easily have... I think... I wonder if he had some hopes that Zalbeg would go with him. Go with it. Yeah. Well, because their family will it's rule like, and there's, there's a yeah. certain expectation like of loyalty to your own family. Yes, yes. Yeah. That Dice Dark seems to be overestimating to some degree. Yes, yes. Like, Especially considering Ramza is out doing what he's doing. To assume that because you're part of my family, you're going to agree with me. Dice Dark, yeah, it's like, I'm the, I'm the patriarch of the family now. Yeah. All of you have to listen to me. That's the yes. rule. That's, how, that's the rule. Of our society. That's how this works. <laughs> yes. And it's like he overestimates. It's a hubris kind of thing. Yeah. Like he, 
he overestimates his own ability, but also the the Beolv name and the you know the integrity of the rest of his family right. to go along with it. But he goes for broke. He goes all out, and he's like, "That's just crazy." See, and this it, is in some ways it makes sense that initiations tend to go like this. It's very shocking and not easy initially when you're initiated into something, right? right. And in this case, he's being initiated into the secret of the Bale family, right? right? He's like, we're, we're all part of this, right? Yep. But, um, and I thought Zalbag would go along with it. I really did. I thought he'd have a tough time for a little bit, but ultimately decide, yeah, we got to do what's necessary. But he doesn't. Nope. And, and he actually is, feels bad for how he treated Ramza. <laughs> this is another thing, another example of what we were just talking about. Yeah. Zalbag is not a character that you can so quickly just dismiss and condemn. Right, right. Because he he did give the order to shoot Tetra. I know, that's the rough part. Awful. He is willing horrible, to do that kind of thing. He's willing to do that. That's yeah. what he's capable of doing. Yes. But he is not capable of allowing Dice Dark to go uh, this far. Yes. And he has some semblance or some sense of honor left in him. Yeah. That is like, nope, I will at least not let you do this. Yeah. This is too much. Killing this peasants is, too far. is fine. Killing nobles. <laughs> well, killing is our father. Bad. Killing well, Mar, the father is the real over the, the line. The, the yeah. completely power hungry or, yeah. or, or corrupted power seeking uh, you know, plots that he's putting in place. It's like this is way beyond the pale. Yeah. And this makes Ramza's scene make a little more sense when Ramza approaches him yeah. and says, hey, Dice Stark's going crazy. You need to do something about our brother. He's going to ruin everything. Um, initially, it's like, why, why would Ramza go to Zalbag and like, Zalbag's not good either and Dice Stark is, like clearly Zalbag isn't going to side with Ramza. And why does Ramza think Zalbag would listen to him? Yeah. But when we see this scene, it's like, you know, Ramza grew up with him and probably knew that Zalbag really did have some integrity to him yeah. uh, apart from Dice Darg, and that he would likely does have a line in the sand where it's like, don't cross this line. Yeah. Right. And Ramza would have known that. So throughout this scene, we can kind of see maybe a little bit more a decent enough reason for why Ramza would have approached him and yeah. thought that he would actually listen maybe. Yeah. And he doesn't, but it's like he had a, enough reason to think so because Zalbag is, you know, maybe a little There's more responsive. At least something. There's something in his heart. There. Yeah. And I feel like that's yeah. been consistently written since the time we were introduced like really introduced to the way Ramza interacts with Dice Darg and Zalbag back yeah. in chapter one. Mm. It's like with Dice Darg at the table, uh, yes. all formal, complete mm -hmm. like niceties, not yeah. no real connection between right. them. But when Zalbag comes around to talk to him, there's a little bit more of that like brotherly feel to it. Mm. And you know, he's, he's the one who suggests guarding a castle grows dreadfully, dreadfully dull, doesn't it? Like uh, he's yeah. like telling him to like break the rules. To go have fun. Yeah. He's giving him <laughs> permission to, you know. That's true. That's so. True. There's always been something between Zalbag and and Zalbag even says, "I always considered you a brother," mm, um, right. until this moment. Until that moment, yeah. So Zalbag at least tried genuinely to have some kind of relationship with Ramza that Dice mm. didn't really try to do, and. Yeah, so I feel like that relationship was really consistently written. It really comes to a nice resolution here uh, in Chapter 4 with Zalbag realizing yeah. who Dice Darg is and him turning on him and, yeah. and, and fighting with Ramza against, uh, yep, yep, yep. against Dice Darg here at the end. But before we get to that, uh, you, you get to the Fort Bessala Sluice. So there's like a floodgate, right? A sluice. Yeah. Um, that holds back water, a dam. Um, and Ramza's going to open that sluice to flood the battlefield, which will make it impossible to fight. So uh, like yeah. the, the, this is the battlefield where they're going to meet. But he's going to flood that battlefield. So they'd have to cross the river. Or so. yeah. he would cross, the Hokutan would have to cross a river to get there, and then the north would not be able to because of the where the water ends up. Something. Yeah, like that, it's, right? it's the... The field is so flooded that it's impossible to fight Okay, there. that makes sense. Uh, similar to the Orthanc. The marshes. Oh, I uh, see. Where they Eisenberg. broke the dam and they just filled the whole and valley like with water. Fight now. And it's like against only trees. the only the trees can really walk through yeah, that, right? Yeah. It just floods everybody yeah, out. So they can't up. fight 
in that space anymore. So that's what he does. That's what that little battle is for. He just races up there and pulls the levers and opens the gates and the, the, the area is flooded below, which means that the, the, the battle cannot occur. Yeah. The next scene is Ramza with Oren and Valmafra going down into the dungeons at Bessala and uh, freeing Sid. Yeah. And there's some pretty good dialogue here. Sid, you know, recognizes him even though he was a little boy last time he saw him. That's right, because he was uh, um, Ramza's father's, like, only friend. Yeah, good right? friends. Yeah, so he knew him for a long time. Because, yeah, uh, Barbaneth Beov, Ramza's father, led the Northern Knights in the Fifty Years' War. Yeah, yeah. And Sid Orlandi, up until just recently, with Delita yeah. replacing him, led the Southern Sky Knights. But he did as well during the Fifty Years' War. So that's how they were good friends. They fought together. And so he recognizes Ramza, says you're a spitting image kind of a thing. Like you, oh, uh, yeah. many people have said this now. And yeah. then. Like you remind me, uh, Elder Simon said this, like a bunch of other people have said like you exude, not even just like look like, but you exude the same just sort of yeah. like idealistic heroic qualities of the way he father. carries himself. Yeah, yeah. You, you remind me so much of him kind of a thing. That's kind of a trope in JRPGs a lot of times that happens. No, of course. Of if, course. Especially because most JRPG heroes, their father died at some point. Yeah. It's like, they're, oh, you just like him, <laughs> right? I guess that's actually more just a fantasy trope in general. But Yeah, they say that. My ba Batman Begins has that line. Where it's like, <laughs> you look like your father. Yeah. Of course. Uh, anyways, um, you talk for a while with him, and it's sort of decided that Sid is going to go with your party and like travel with you. And Oren wants to come too, but he's like, no. Uh, Sid says he wants him to go and help Ovelia. Um, like go to Ovelia and get her out right. and protect her. Mm. I'm gonna go with them because what they're fighting is like really, really bad. Like this is Lukavi stuff that we're gonna go handle here, right? This is, the, like he was talking about earlier, like the real war. And he knows. Yeah. Because he, he has one of the He has one of the RSI. And he knows, he knows what the real thing's going on, right? So, that's so, how that ends up going. So immediately after that scene... Oh, what's interesting about this though, what's mm -hmm. really interesting about this is Falmafra Fal is there. And she's sent by the church to watch Delita. Yes. But she's allowing this to I happen. Remember, I can't remember how she got with us, but yeah. Like, yeah. so I, I was a little bit confused about this, and maybe someone in the comments can clarify this plot point. I but had a general what, impression that Delita was in on, yes, in on this. Yes, that's, that's yeah. the part of it that leads me to, le to believe that Delita is a, either allowing this to happen or in on it somehow. Because why would she be there? If she's serving the church, this is like the last thing the church wants, because the church wants Orlando assassinated. Mm. I would think. It wants, they want Goltana and Orlando assassinated and Larg and Dice Darg and Zalbeg. They wanted them all, all the heads cut off. That's what the church wanted done. Yeah. That's what Delita told us back at the cathedral at Zeltenia. So, anyways. But they're secretly this saving one of the. Yeah, like Orlando is being let go. And yeah. Val Valmafra, Valmafra is allowing that to happen, which leads me to believe she was sent by Delita somehow, or that Delita. Because Delita in the next scene, as we see, right. kills a false Orlando. Yes. So he has to have had some knowledge of it, but the, the motivations behind this, particularly with her character being a servant of the church, or at least sent by them to keep watch over Delita, is a little confusing to me. Yeah. I just, I'm not sure where she's at in all of this. Because she seems loyal to the church in a scene later, but here she seems loyal to Ron, to, to Delita. To Delita specifically. So I'm, I'm just, yeah. a, it's a little cloudy for me mm. what's going on with her. But she is there. So I assume Delita sent her. That Delita knows. Um, yeah. So in the next scene, Goltana calls <laughs> Delita in. Goltana uh, is, he's, he's kind of losing it a little bit. Like he's not making sense anymore. Yeah. Um, he's really desperate, it feels like. He's made a lot of tough decisions, mm -hmm. and um, he really wants to win this battle. It's like this was the point where they were going to win the war. It was yeah. like this was this was really important. Yeah, and so he commands Delita to lead the Southern Sky Knights into the flooded battlefield and fight them anyways. Yeah, and Delita's saying that's not possible. 
you can't fight in those conditions. Right. And he's like, I don't want to hear that. Just do it. Just go. Mm. He's like, no, I have to refuse. And he's like, what? And then that's when Delita stands up, rushes him, and yeah. assassinates him on the spot. It's always surprising <laughs> when people get assassinated in this game. It just happens so quickly. It's yeah. like, whoa, holy cow. Oh, my goodness. That's how he chose to do it. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. And the Kotana's like totally shocked, slumps to the ground and dies. But they need a scapegoat for this, too. Yes. So the original plan was to assassinate them both. But now they've decided to frame the assassination of Goltana on Orlando, which yep. will make sense, especially with any other um, council members remaining in the southern oh, sure. sky, because they saw the dissension of yeah. Orlando in the meetings earlier. And the rumor was Orlando was fomenting a rebellion of sorts. Right, which is so why he was arrested like, in the first place. Sound, yes, so the it's like, so we, can, we can keep yeah. that lie going and, it, and people will buy it. Yeah. So what they do is they bring in a, a devout from the Church of Glabados. Yeah. Dressed as Orlando and they kill him in place of Orlando. So that was a, a faithful, faithful man, I suppose. This person willing to give their life for yeah, St. Yeah. Ajora and the cause of Gladios. Right. But Delita felling that stroke is another yeah. indictment <laughs> yes. in his many list of things he's done yeah. on this path to his end goal. It's just like, dude, that is really cold stuff. That was stuff. brutal. That was brutal. And he doesn't really think twice about it. No. I think he asks him, he's like, okay, are you ready? And the guy's like, yeah, I'm ready. It's like, all right. Just kills Dead. him. Just like, dude. dude. <sighs> Intense, right? Even, even if it's planned, even if it's set up and the guy's like, I'm ready to the die. The guy's even you willing to do it. You still have to pull the trigger, you know, so to speak. You have, you have to you're, you're do the thing. You're taking advantage of this man's faith. So, because Delita understands what's really going on with Glabados. This Glabados devout doesn't. Exactly. He's, he's an innocent like peasant, more or less. Yes. And he's giving his life in faith to something yeah. that he doesn't realize what it actually is. And Delita's taking advantage of it that totally for the plot. Totally using that, yeah. So, are, I don't know if you know this, actually. Um, I actually, I know somebody who mm. uh, used to work at a, work for the government. I think he worked at a prison or so. He was an executioner. He would kill people. Oh, wow. He was in charge of lethal injections and of the ways to, uh, That's crazy. to kill people. I would yeah. imagine people in that job might not always last that long in it. 22 years or so, I think. Oh, He's there 22 years. He is a dark person <laughs> yeah. to be around. And, and he has, he entered into it as a, as a, as a Christian and upon exiting his job. No longer. No, not even close. Like, basically as nihilistic as you can be, he, mm. he's an interesting person. Um, he has, he doesn't have any moral code at all. Um, he, that, that changes you, man. It's so weird. Even, even when it's like, oh, these are the worst people that, okay, the, the prosecutors tell me these are the worst people in the world and it's okay to kill them. Someone still has to do it. Mm -hmm. And, the people who then do that job, that is like, it, 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 it just completely destroys them. It completely destroys them. It still has that kind of effect. Yes, even though it's like, I have to, someone has to do this and um, the, they deserve it. Any way that you try to justify it, and this is where Dostoevsky's writings, specifically Crime and Punishment and elsewhere, oh, sure. are so, so on point. It's like, it doesn't matter how much you justify it. When you kill somebody, you lose your soul. Yeah. <laughs> like, you really do. And, and it's, it's just wild. So anyways, as Delita is playing the role of executioner Well, here, this happens it's to soldiers, that kind too. Of thing. PTSD, yes, that's true. Soldiers, when they, totally they true. kill in war, it's like yes. they have horrific, long-lasting, terrifying memories of the yeah. act. It's like, yep. I, I've known some people who have fought, even in the recent wars, yeah. who have killed people, and they... They can't sleep at night. They become right. alcoholics. And they it's, it's as justifiable as you can make yeah. it. Yeah. But that's not enough. Yeah. That's not enough for what your mind and your body, how, how your, your soul will react right. to doing something like that. Right. Delita is a hard man. <laughs> like, <laughs> at this point, he is a hard, hard man. He's killed a lot of people. Yeah. And it's, that changes a person. Yeah. Inevitably, you, right? You don't want it to, but it does. It inevitably does. Um, 
So I put this down, Delita killed, this is so funny, that this is my note that I put down immediately after that. Delita killed a Gravados person and Goltana, uh, but the Gravados, it says Gravados in PS1, what is it? Glabados. Glabados, okay. The L and the R again. <laughs> Uh, but the Glavados um, person was, you know, willing to die as he looked like Sid, which is interesting. I'm impressed the director didn't go with the temptation to make us think Delita had killed the real Sid. Mm. This is what I wrote down. That's funny. A week ago. <laughs> Anyways, it, I, it's impressive though. Yeah. I really think so. Whenever a director exercises restraint, I mean, I wrote this down. Most most game slash movie directors would have done that. They would have made you think that he killed the real Sid. Right. It's it's an urge that's hard to resist. Sure. Because it's such a trope Oh, that we can have another twist. It's been done so many but times. But how yes, can you really get away with that because Sid's gonna be in your party for the rest of the game. So they couldn't really... They could at that. least get away with it for a little bit. <laughs> just for like <laughs> and five then minutes. reveal just a few for minutes one later. Minute. Just, just, get a, just try, just for like 10 Reverse seconds. Reverse the scene. Make them think he died make, for 10 seconds. Make the Delita and... Goltana assassination scene come first, yes. then the Ramza there going into go. the dungeons and yeah. getting Sid out. They second. could have done that, sure. but so much respect for them, to Matsuno and whoever else was involved with the scenario writing here, for not doing it. Yeah. Because it's so irresistible, but it's more interesting when you see things play out this way. Yeah. When you know what's going to happen and you see it, it, it's so much more interesting to watch Delita kill a perfectly innocent priest, priestly, maybe a deacon, what would you call it? Just a, a church person who's low, yeah. low on the on the totem pole, right? Mm-hmm. It's way more impactful to know that this is a stand-in who is willing to give their life for God, and to be just slaughtered for a purpose that is not for God, what not they what think they think. It is. And that's way more impactful than the temptation of like, <laughs> gotcha, and then you, <laughs> then you don't think of what Delita yeah, just did. You don't think of it, because you're like, Sid, and then, and oh, okay, never mind. But you then you miss the impact it of that It distracts scene. you from how this is contributing to the game's thematic core. Yes, the theme. It would not have gone well with the theme to have done that cheap. Yeah. Shock value. Every scene in Matsuno games, maybe outside of a f- one or two here or there, yeah, a is few accidents. in service to yeah. the holistic vision. To the message he's trying to, to stay. To stay. As you mentioned before, he found a story, a mechanism to deliver a message. Yes. So the message is what's important. Yes. And he's not losing sight of that, yes. even as a pop game director for a 15-year-old. You know, he, yes. He's still like, no. We're, we're, we're conveying a message here. Yeah. I don't even know if I would have resisted that urge. I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, they think they killed Sid. Like, yeah. I really would do that. I really think that I would have done that. <laughs> it's so hard to resist. Right. Because it's just easy, and you, you can imagine your audience being so shocked and then so relieved afterwards, and you think that, that, that you're doing the right thing there. But, but it, anyways, would be, it would be distracting from it would the, have real, been distracting. the real point. Yes, because then you'd have to think back after the game and be like, oh, wait. Like, like I thought of when Delita killed the guy in the court, where it's mm. like, uh, you know, at the end of chapter two, like, oh wait, that guy was probably totally innocent, yeah. and Delita just framed him and then killed him right there. Yeah. Like, I didn't think about that until later, right? Yeah. And that was, well, the way the game works, it's kind of shocking, and the, you, you kind of don't have time to process it until later. Um, but with this one, I don't know, just super well done. Well yeah. done, Matsuno. Super great. Okay. Um... So we have another kind of like, it's like a narration over the top. I think it's actually, um, this is not Arislam's voice. This is uh, Ramza's voice. Uh, it says, like, the high confessor came forward with his offer to mediate a peace between oh, the camps. Real quick, hold on. This is another thing. I, this is why I think Delita was in on this. Oh, okay. Okay, so my last note here is Delita. There's a line he says at the very end of that scene after assassinating Mm -hmm. Goltana. He says, pray that Ramza will take care of the rest. Ah, yes, yes. Was there a line Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. there? Okay. I remember that. I don't, like, he didn't coordinate it with us necessarily, but it's like he knew what was going to happen and he was allowing it to happen and he allowed Sid to go and he got his stand in well ahead of time and everything was prepared for what we did, which was we're going on our own journey, we're taking Sid and that's fine. And and Delita actually think that's preferable. He thinks that he'd rather have us with Sid to accomplish our mission. This actually makes sense to me now because Delita's gonna take care of the Goltana, Larg, Dice Darg Yes, all those people, yeah. The political problem. Yes. He's gonna let Ramza deal with the church problem. Yes, because he is not well positioned for that one. No. 
he can't get. Yeah, that makes sense. So he's he's, so that's he's why using. That's why he that's why set it up. Val Maffer was saying he was using his friend. He's yes. using his friend yes. for a mission that's yeah. probably well for sure way more dangerous. Mm. And I'll let well, and him the go risk his life yes. to end the church's ambitions, yeah. which will put me in position to lead the kingdom afterwards. Everything. Yeah. So he's using his friend to position himself yeah. and to take care of the church for him. Now I understand why Valmafra was sent by Delita down there yeah. to let sit up. That makes sense. And this clues us in that Delita actually does trust us. He's regained his trust. He yeah. had lost it for a while. Yeah. And he didn't even want us to be around Ovelia. He wanted he he was very reluctant to let us take her even early in chapter two. Right. Uh, but he is now to the point where he trusts us to accomplish a very big important thing right, right. for him. So he didn't trust us earlier. We had to regain it. He's using us, I know. But early with Algus, it was explained that even Ramza was using Delita to an extent earlier in chapter one. People use each other. It's a theme of the game, right? Yeah. And so he does still trust us even while using us, but you know. Right. That's how it is. I, I like the development here with the characters. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, so the, that final narration there. The High Confessor Marcel came with his offer to mediate a peace between the camps, but though their leaders had been lost, their capacity to make war had not. Of course, <laughs> that's, of course. The High happens. Confessor's offer fell on deaf ears. I made for Limberry and for Alma. Mm. So he's now met with Delita, stopped that battle from happening, but now it's like, okay, I, this has distracted me too long mm. from going and saving my sister who was taken by Falmarv at the end of chapter three. Yeah. I gotta go to Linberry where, remember, Elmdor said like, come to Linberry and like, take my stone from me. Yes, that's so right. So that's where he's after, that's what he's on now. Yeah. He doesn't care anymore about Basically for the rest stuff. of the game, he just wants to save I Alma. I gotta get Alma now. Yeah. Alma um, means spirit, I think, by the way, in some Egyptian or something like that. Oh, really? Yeah. I know that it's a pretty common, uh, like, South American name. Oh, yeah, in Spanish. Well, yeah. maybe it's in Spanish that it means spirit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Alma, yeah, yeah, that's what it means. Um, okay, so the next battle is Mount Germinus, and it's just thieves trying to kill you for bounty. Don't really have any prevalence to the plot. Yeah. Uh, the next one is at Lake... Oh, but in that mediation to end the war, it is revealed that Raffle knows that Dystar killed his father. There's that part. Raffle? R-O-F-E-L. Who is that in the war? It's the person <laughs> offering the... It might be the confessor. It's the person offering the deal to Dystar. And Dystar's ign ignoring it, saying, No, we're D not... Dystar? I see Dice Star. Oh, Lawfrey! Lawfrey. Ah, there that's you go. who it is. And is this okay. the right scene? Um, that's coming up. Oh, okay, that's later. Okay, that's, that's later. coming up. Now I know. <laughs> that, the name was so confusing. And again, Raffle. L and R were La completely <laughs> oh <my laughs> reversed. <God>. Wait, <laughs> Raffle Lawfrey? Lawfrey. Oh L and then R. And this one's Raffle. It's just unbelievable, dude. Like, <laughs> what were they thinking? <laughs> What were they thinking? Oh my god! This is so stupid. Oh, at this raffle, point. Raffle? This is dumb. R O F L. Unbelievable. That is so. He's rolling the floor laughing. Rolling on the floor like, laughing. Like we are right now. It's R O F E L, but you know whatever. Okay, okay, okay. Let's continue. <laughs> yes. So the next scene, at you head towards Lake. I think it's Poescus. Poescus, and you get a scene. You just fight ghosts there. There's like, yeah, yeah, again, no real, they're like, oh, we're the the spirits of the people who died on this battlefield and now you'll join us in death and then we'll be able to go to the afterlife and you can be trapped here or something. Mm. I don't know what that's all about. Okay. Who cares? The important part is that after that scene, you get a scene with Dice Dark speaking with the Knight Templar, Lafrey. With this is Lafrey. the same Knight that's Templar who recruited Wygraf uh, when he was yes. at his sister's grave. Yes, yes, yes. So it's that guy. So Lafrey is talking to Dystarg, and his real purpose in being there is to deliver an aura sight to Dystarg. That's ah, his, yes. what he's really doing. Yeah. But they're also talking about negotiating some kind of, you know, peace. Dystarg's not having it. Not even close. Um, yeah. And so he's like, "All right. Well, if that's the case, uh, he starts uh, with some very underhanded accusations." Yes. 
yes. about how Dystar killed his father. Said, oh, you know uh, that fungus poison? It's uh, it's a doozy, ain't it? <laughs> yeah. When did your dad die again? And it's like <laughs> yeah. really, really like leading questions. Yeah. Dystar's just like. Are you suggesting I did something improper? Yeah. And Lawfrey's like, oh no, of course not. No, of not, course of not. Course not. <laughs> but did you know that fungus grows on the bodies after? Yeah. Just, just wondering if you knew that piece yeah. of information. And Dice Dog's like sweating. Like you don't see it, but you can you can tell in the dialogue. Yeah. Like he's sweating and he's just like, I thought no one knew about this. And it does make me wonder how Lawfrey knew about that. Right. I don't know how he knows. That's true. I actually but it didn't could question be, that. But it could yeah. be that Lawfrey has been to the grave. Maybe. And seen the fungus. Yeah. That could be it. Because yeah. that's what he mentions. He's the like, church you know. somehow was aware of that Dystark poisoned his father. Yeah. With this same mushroom that they used, the spores on the wind for the On battle. the wind for all those people, yeah. And the great thing about this is that the scene is happening right there, right? But then the camera rotates around to Who the back is it? side. Who is that? It's, it's Zellbag. See, listening. I didn't know that. In the PS1 version, I saw a person... And I didn't know who it was. And I was like, someone overheard that conversation, but I don't know who it's that Zalbag. was. It's Zalbag. So okay. Zalbag, his suspicion of what Larg said yeah. about Dystar killing their father. He's like, it's true. Is eating at him. And so yeah. he's listening in on this conversation. He learns about how that mushroom will grow in the grave of someone who's been poisoned. So and he's got to go He's going to go check that out. Mm -hmm. It's just a really nice reveal. That makes sense. That it was where they him. rotated the camera and Zalbag's like listening in, like eavesdropping on their conversation. So that was a really nice scene. But the important thing here is that uh, Lafrey gives an Arasite stone to Dice Dark. And yep, we yep. all know as players of the game what they're doing here is they're, yeah. they're setting planting up the a Lukavi demon to yes. take over Dice Dark. This is how they're yeah. taking Dice Dark down yep. by giving him that Arasite stone. And like the Lord of the Rings, like the Rings of Power, mm -hmm. if you want to control one yeah. of the leaders, you offer them a ring. something that they can't refuse that then enables you to control them, right? right? And uh, that does happen in modern politics, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> that does happen. But um, that's what's happening here. So it's a gift that these powerful people can't refuse. They can't refuse it. Right. But as soon as they get it, it consumes them. Exactly. Um, and, and, and they only work for demon possession if the heart of the person who tries to use the power is... Is negative, Is right? bad, is, is yeah. uh, evil to begin with, right? So it's like, Dice Dark's going to get possessed For by sure. Demon. We all know that. So happening. you only <laughs> give it to power-hungry people, which yeah. tend to be the people in power anyways. Sure. So. All right, so then we get to Limberry Castle finally. This is where Elmdor's castle is. He's Elmdor, the, the, um, the Marquess of uh, Limberry, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, there's a scene here, well, I guess the first part is on the outside, where you first approach the castle, and you fight against Celia and Letty, who are the two, oh, yeah. like, fighter women who mm -hmm. were with Elmdor on the, the roof of the Riovanes oh, castle. Oh, up there, yes, that's right. Yeah. That battle that totally sucks yes, balls. Yes, that horrible <laughs> battle. That's, that's who they are. So they fight you on the outside of the castle, then they warp out. They go inside and warn Elmdor that you're coming. Um, but that's in the middle of a scene between him, Elmdor, and Falmarth. So they're having a, a, a conversation here about their plans. Um, Ramza has already killed two Lukavi at this point. Yeah, He's yeah. killed two of their yep. demon comrades. So they, they're taking him seriously now. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're talking about this. Falmarv um, is mentioning how he has found the host for their, or they found, first of all, they found a host for one of their other Lukavi brethren, Adramelik, Adramelik. <laughs> I have no idea how that's supposed Probably to be pronounced. Probably means something in, in <coughs> Hebrew, that Melik meaning angel, something This is the, the Lukavi who's going to take Dystarg's body. Mm. The, so that's, they gave him that Arasite, right? Okay. Um, so he says, do not worry over Adralamek. He will join us ere long. And then Elmdor, who is also possessed, right? He also has an Arasite. He asks him, you've found a host? And um, Falmar says, not I, the stone. The stone chooses the flesh, as it was with us. Mm. So the stone wanted to go to die star. Okay. <laughs> Just like the ring wants to yes, go back to Sauron's hand. Yes, it wants to hand. be found. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, but, but he also mentions that um, Alma is going to be the host for the, the, the vessel for the master that they're trying to bring mm. back, the, the high seraph. Yeah. Or probably seraph. angel. It's just that angel here. Yeah. Same thing. Um, but the high seraph, right? So Elmdor is going to stay behind to take care of Ramza. He, he, the, the two women come in and warn him that they're mm. on their way in. So I'll stay here and fight them. You and go then, take Alma well, to Mulande. Oh, yes. Where you're going to try and find an opening to mm -hmm. the Necra Hall or to the hell of this world. Yeah. Um, where you can then revive uh, revive the High Seraph. So Falmarv goes off to do that. He's, he's going to go and confront the High Confessor. That's his next ah, point. Ah, yes. Where he's going to try to find out, okay, what, how do I open the Necra Hall? Like, you yeah. know how I do this. Tell me how. They're going to make mm -hmm. him tell him how. While Elmdor stays behind to try to and High Confessor, that's like the Pope, right? Yeah, <coughs> exactly. The the Cardinal Delacroix was second to the High Confessor, who yeah. is I think like, basically like the Pope, like the top top church. top, yeah, leader. Um, and and I guess their their sort of like base of operations is in a, a city called Mulande. Yeah, that's that's where that's at. It's so <laughs> we had a question about that earlier. <laughs> it's Muran. Oh my gosh. <laughs> M U R O N D. <laughs> Anyways, okay. <clears throat> yes, move we on were there. questioning, I think, in last episode, um, like where these people were from, because there was a confessor yeah. who came to arrest Ramza at the at the, um, the 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 kingdom's capital, which is not Mulande. It was the it was the place where he went and talked to Zalbag at. Oh yeah. Um, that's like where the was queen it? lived and Prince Orinus lived and oh, Andoria. Yeah. I forget the name of that city right at this moment, but we were wondering, oh, I wonder if that's where the Pope is too. And so they just like came oh, from so down the right street there? when they heard Ramza showed up. Yeah. Or if they had sent somebody from Milande to go find Ramza after hearing he was on his way there. Anyways, mm. I guess it's not that important, but Milande is But that's where, where they came from. The church's headquarters are in Milande. Yeah. That's where Falmarv is going while Elmdor fights us. So he comes to face you and uh, Ramza says, where do you hide my sister? And El I liked Elmdor's response to this. Questions are the right of a victor, Ramza, not that of a man about to meet his end. And Ramza says, I await you, or, or sorry, you fight him there. Uh, you fight against him and the two girls who transform into like, you, well, you, you beat them in their human form, and then they have like a second form, like a yeah, demon form course, that comes yeah. up after that. So it's just the, the fight against the three of them. Um, and as, as you finish the battle, he says, I await you in the Undercroft. It is there that your darling sister sleeps. So he goes further down into his castle. Mm. You follow him down into the inner court. And this is an added battle for the War of the Lions version, one that I am very conflicted about. Oh, really? Because Algus comes back. Oh, really? <laughs> Wait, really? This is what I was from, referring to. From the Netherworld? Yeah, or, he's okay. like one of the revived... Because that does happen later. ...zombie okay. version of Algus. Algus, huh. Um, well, okay. A lot of people, and Wait, I... Wait, but there are other... There were other people who came back, too. I'm trying to think of who the other... Well, Zalbag later. Zalbag. Does. Oh, that's later. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're right. Um, trying to so think, Algus, was there another huh? one? Another person who came back to life as a zombie? I don't think so. I think this is the first hmm. instance in this version of the game. But there's a lot of people, and I agree with the sentiment in, to a large degree, who are like, oh, this battle's totally unnecessary. Why would you bring Algus back? Yeah. How does this serve the plot? It's a fan favorite. <coughs> yeah, it's yeah, like it feels like that. Yeah. It feels like, a, oh, these people who grew up playing Final yeah. Fantasy Tactics will like having one more Algus scene. Get to kill him again. I'm not yeah. sure that I do, and I'm not sure that mm. I believe this serves the story at all. I feel like really? this shouldn't have been added. Um, when, when they made this War of the Lions version, how much of a say did I don't think the original I don't think Mutsuno wa, uh, Mits, Matsuno <laughs> Matsuno was involved in War of the Lions. So I guess we could check that and see and like fact check ourselves or put it in, in the a comment. pinned comment or something. Kay. But I don't believe that Matsuno was involved in the War of the Lions version of the game. Well, then that makes sense. Um, so, anyways, I mm. I don't think that this scene helps the story that much. I I. I don't, I don't, I don't think the scene belongs, but it is interesting to bring up. So he comes back, 
and uh, meet you as you're going down to try and uh, pursue Limbury, uh, Elmdor. And Ramza says, Argoth, how did, I thought you were dead. And Argoth says, dead? Oh, Ramza, your mind's as common as your friend's. I did not die. I was reborn, chosen by a greater power. Um, so it's the same exact thing that happens to Zalbeth. Yeah. So it's not like you, you, you can't just like point to this as if it's this isolated thing mm. and be like, they just did this as some excuse to bring Algus back. I mean, you can into a sense, but it's like, it's not like unprecedented. Zalbag is also revived in this way later. Yeah. So it's not like it's totally out of bounds yeah, it's part of the for world. the world of right. Final Fantasy Tactics. But there is something to it that feels unnecessary, and I, d I don't for particularly sure. love this. And I think it's added. better for a moment like that to happen with somebody you cared about. Yeah. Where it's like, oh my gosh, I have to fight the zombie of the beloved the, my brother. brother. Yeah. Exactly. That, that's more impactful than you learning about it through, oh, oh no, this person's a zombie. Uh, but I hated him anyways, and even if he wasn't a zombie, I'd still kill him. Yeah. But it's like with Zalbag, you only There's have to kill him because he's a there. zombie. I don't want to kill you. Yeah, like I feel like it devalues it a little. I, 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 that's yeah. how I feel. But I did like that at the end of the battle, he's calling to his mother as he dies again. <laughs> oh, no way. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so at least I like to see uh, Algus for su the second suffer, time suffer, suffer like more. that. Um, okay, then you get to the Undercroft, and this is where you fight Elmdor, and he... Uh, transforms into Zalrea, the Death Seraph, his, uh, his Lukavi form. Uh, Meliadol comes back. Oh, yes, yes. This That's is where interesting. she sees for that, the first that time we were that right. what we were telling her was real. Yes. And there's uh, some conflict in this because her father is involved in this. Too. Oh, yeah. And this is where she learns, like, wait, is my father also still with it? Lukavi, and we're like, yeah. no, he's gone. You, mm -hmm. Your father's already lost. He's already dead. But anyways, yeah. you fight Elmdor. Melidol kind of comes in in the middle of the battle. Um, but you win that fight, and you have a really good conversation with her at the end. And they're contemplating why the Lukavi have all this power. They, they, could, they could wipe out armies at this point but they haven't really used it yet, right? Like he's talking about the slaughter back at Riovanes. It's like, mm. if the if the Lukavi are this powerful, like why aren't they moving yet? Like what right, are they waiting yeah. for? What is it that is holding them from like just causing havoc and just taking over by force? Mm. And so they're not sure. They, they feel like there's something missing that they don't understand yet. Um, and then the, she reveals to Ramza, that Dystarg was given one of these stones. Mm. And this is what causes him to race back. Yeah. Because uh, another thing Limberry says, um, I can't give that which I never had, in reference to Alma. So he's like... Yes, well, in the way he said it in PS1, yeah. he says, uh, well, okay, he doesn't necessarily say it this way. My note says the princess is in another castle. <laughs> that was the note that I took. <laughs> That's true. But he told us, he said, Alma is here, so those people have no integrity. Yeah. But yeah, he's like, Alma's not here. It was all a distraction. It was a ruse. To keep him from following Falmarv and to kill him there. But it's yes. like, Alma was never with me. I never had Alma. Falmarv has Alma, so I can't give that which I don't have. But yep. he, he deceived him into thinking he's got her down in the Undercroft. But yeah. he never, she was never there. And then when uh, Meliadul joins our party, this is the point when that happened is the point where I just decided that there, this game has a few too many characters. Yeah, it's There's probably, just a couple too yeah, many. It's starting to get... It's getting a lot. And at this point, it's time. like not only the character, but the spouse of the character and the father of the character. You, you're having to keep track of a lot of relationships. And once you meet one character, then you meet that character's family. And it, it just widens out. You just branch out into so many there different There is people. one question from one of our patrons that addresses this exact thing. OK. Um, so we'll talk about that more. I didn't feel later. like it was too much until literally she joined our party. Yeah. And even meeting her, I was like, OK, whatever. But once she joined, I was like, there's a lot of people in this game. <laughs> there's just a lot of characters. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so yeah, you, you race back to Egros yeah. to confront uh, Dystarg. Do we get a scene with Delita um, before we get... There? No, there's a Ovelia scene here, yes, before you go back all the way there. So there's Ovelia, 
hearing mm. some fighting in the hallway, and then Oren busts yes. through the door. Yes. Ovelia recognizes him. Of course, he's wounded. She goes to him, and he tries to let her, tries to tell her that Delita is plotting. Yeah. Um, the, that he plotted the assassination of Goltana and the framing of Sid for that deed. Right. So he's trying to explain to her, Delita's not who you think he is. And he kind of fought his way in. Mm hmm. And then, and this. then uh, Vamafra and Delita come in. And Delita's trying to explain to Ovelia because she's, she's feeling conflicted here. She doesn't know what to believe. She definitely trusts Oren, but she, does, she wants to trust Delita because she has feelings for Delita. And Delita has feelings for her. Those feelings have been growing. Mm -hmm. So he says to her, I told you, didn't I? I work to see you made a queen for true. So she's asking, like, what, is, mm -hmm. what are you doing? Like, why are you doing all this, right? And then she says, not you do is for true. You wish only to use me like the rest. So she's still feeling, even though she doesn't yeah. want to believe that, she's still feeling like he's using her. Yeah. And, and so he says, you don't trust me? And she pauses. You trust me or you don't, Ovelia, which is it? And she says, I, I want to trust you. I want you. to trust you, I yeah. do, but it's not such an easy thing. She's really struggling with that. So he tells her, I promise you, I'm not going to hurt Oren. I'm not going to kill him. Right. Please go back to your chambers. I have to speak with him in private. And I really love this because she's like, okay. And she goes down and she, she opens pretends to and open shuts the door. Yeah. And then comes back in and yeah, listens. Yeah, yeah. I liked that as a really nice um, uh, point of agency for the character. They're sure. giving her a moment where she can make her own choice. Her own particularly choice. in a story where yeah. she has none almost the whole time. She's yeah. being dragged around all the time. And here, it's just a nice moment where she's taking some control a little bit. Yeah. And like saying, no, I will listen in on this. I'm not I gonna let do you use I'm told. me. I'm not gonna do as I'm told. So that's a good, um, Delita asks her the question, don't you trust me? Yeah. And she can't answer in words, but she answers in her actions. Yes. Right? So as soon as she leaves, she doesn't, she shuts the door and steps around the corner to listen. And right. that is the answer to the question. Yep. Do you trust him? No. No, I don't. But, but it's shown and not told. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. I love it. Um, so Delete goes on to say he's planning on bringing down the northern sky and uh, making, also making the High Confessor answer for his crime. So he's, he's wanting to do yes. both things. Yes, and this is where his number two assistant kind of gets <laughs> a little uneasy. Yeah, she's not, she's not sure. She's like, wait, because she, she didn't know his She didn't know that plans. he was planning on taking the church down. Too. Yes. So he says, a common-born squire takes the reins of a knightly order and leads a wayward kingdom from the midst of chaos. The masses yearn for a hero. I will give them what they wish for. My note right after that line was, um, Delita is falling in love with himself. Yep, his own legend. His, his own idea of himself, his own story. Yep. He's falling in love with the ideal of what he thinks he could be. Yep. But it's unattainable. Yep. And I, well, here we are at the end of the game. He, he cannot attain that ideal. It's, yep. it's unattainable, right? And so he's falling in love with the fake thing of his own creation. Yeah. Uh, that's a great point. And I love Oren's response to that, which is, using ought and all to forge your legend, mm. which is a, basically a direct accusation like, of his consequentialist attitude. You're just telling your own life story, but you're killing people to do it? You'll do anything, You'll do anything, anything. for that? Yeah. Anything at all. There's no boundary you won't cross. Just so that you can be this cool story that people <laughs> can be like, hey, he was cool. And, and Delita's response to that is, is that so wrong? Yeah, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, you're gone at that point. Yeah. You are gone it's, at that point. Yeah. Too far. He right? has, he has fallen in love with his own, his own, uh, himself, and his own idea. And that's the point where Valmafra pulls a knife on him mm. and threatens to kill him. And he's like, ah, oh, I'm unarmed. Here I am. Like he opens his arms. Yes. Like if you're going to do it, you better do it right now because you're right. not going to get another chance. Yes. This is the time. Yeah. And she hesitates. And because she hesitates, he says, well, you can't blame me for this then. And he rushes her, and she screams, and the screen goes black. Yeah. The, I guess the assumption would be there that he kills that her. That he kills her, yeah. That's it, yeah. 
Anyways, we'll come back to Yeah, that. we'll come back to that. <laughs> but that was a really good scene. It was a really great scene. It was it's really, fantastic really good. Fantastic scene. Phenomenal scene. One of the better ones in the game, in my opinion, again. Um, okay, so then uh, we see the scene where Zalbag goes to his father's grave and confirms that the moss fungus is growing on it. Yeah. So he takes yep. like a like a chemist with him. It's it's yes, a, it's the sprite right, for yeah, a chemist yeah. class. Yes, of course, <laughs> just a generic yeah. Joe Schro chemist. He's like, uh, tell me what this mushroom is, and he throws it at him. He's like, oh, this is moss fungus, and uh, you know it does this and this, and it uh, grows on the graves of people who are poisoned. He basically confirms exactly yes. what Lafrey was accusing Dysargo. But I I question Zalbag even still mm. at this point because yeah. of Zalbag's past. He's right. done messed up things. I was thinking, this chemist is going to die. Yeah. Right. No one can know. As soon as Zalbag figures it out, he'll be like, okay, Die Stark sucks, but we're ending this together. And thanks for confirming, chemist. <laughs> right. <laughs> because you can't allow other people to know about this. Yeah. And it would be clear, it was clear at the point of where they were standing, yeah. what had, had happened. happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Zalbag does not kill the chemist, which is like, okay, good. That was his first test, right? right. And he is, he, he really does have a conscience. He's not a psychopath like Dice Stark. Right. He does mess up stuff for different reasons, but he does have a soul. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in there, right? Yeah. And I like, he kind of tosses him some money. And he's like, uh, you know, this is what we bargained for. The rest is to forget what you've seen here. Exactly, right? he pays him instead of killing him. And I love the response yeah. of the guy. He's like, forget what? And then he just turns around and walks exactly. away. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Die Stark would have would have just killed him. Yeah. Like no questions asked. Like you're done. And so would Delita have actually. Yeah. Delita would have been like, okay, thank you, you're dead. Yep. But Zalbag does not, and that's fascinating because Zalbag's the one that killed, that gave the command to kill Tetra. To kill Tetra. Yeah. Yet, and that um, that Delita hates him for that. But yeah. at the same time, Delita has descended below. Zalbag in, to in degree, what he's yeah. willing to do, mm -hmm. and that's, I mean, that's crazy. Beautiful in a storytelling it's poetic. sense. Poetic. It's poetic. That is incredibly yeah. poetic. And and um, Delita would just have no idea that he is really below the level of Zalbag. He has become worse than what he hated yeah. at the start. Even maybe worse. not maybe not worse than Dystarg. Not Dystarg, but Zalbag. But he's worse than Zalbag. Because Zalbag is the one that he would really have beef with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so there's another new battle to War of the Lions against um, Kletian, who, I mean, this is kind of funny because we're talking about so many characters being introduced even at this late stage in the game, right? This is another one of the Knights Templar, and he's a boss in, once you get to the Necro Hall section. Oh, but it's yeah. like you've never seen this character before. Mm. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he's one of the Knights Templar that you fight in the Necro Hall. So they added a battle to introduce this character oh, okay. here before you go there. And um, okay. it's kind of an interesting scene. Uh, it, it's in Dorter, so it's the same map screen as the Dorter battle where you get ambushed after Falmarf pays those like thieves when, when you're traveling with um, oh, yes. Ovelia yep, 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 and, yep. and Gafgarian at the beginning of the game. Mm -hmm. So it's that map screen as you're heading back west towards Egros. Um, and he, he introduces himself, he says, I come in Lord Falmar's stead to see his will made manifest. And he uses like a, a type of time magic that uh, freezes Ramza in place yep. so he can't move. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to cast this spell that will like kill him for good. But the spell is reflected and hits him instead. Mm. And he's like, what? And then Meliodul comes out. And oh, she, nice. She basically saved Ramza Very at that nice. point. Very nice. And she nice. has a conversation with Kletian about her father. Is it, is it true that my father is a Lukavi? Mm -hmm. Is this like really happening? You have a battle there, and in the end, he says, You have eyes, go see for yourself, yep. and then leaves. Yep. So that scene I thought was a nice addition. Okay. To cool. one, introduce who Kletian even is, <laughs> yeah. two, to have Melia Dull a little develop more for her. a little more. Because yeah. part of the reason I felt like we had too many characters with the addition of Melia Dull is that we didn't know anything about her, and all of a sudden she's here, she has her own extra little plot line that I have to think about now, but I'm just not too concerned with it. Yeah. I don't really care about her or her plot at all. Yeah. Uh, but the more you can develop a character like that, then the more it's meaningful, especially if she's going to meet her own father. Yeah. So. It just adds that little extra bit. It was like... 
You saw yeah. her when she tried to fight you at the beginning of chapter four. You killed my brother, I'm gonna get you. And then you don't see her for a long time. And then she just kind of shows up at Limberry Castle again and is more or less used to give you the information that Dice Darks is gonna become a Lukavi. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, you don't see her again. But at least here, it's like there's at least another scene where we can see her struggling with this idea of her father being Lukavi, yeah. coming to terms with the reality of what happened to Isolude, the fact that Ramza is not the murderer or heretic she thought yes, he was. just a little more time. Yeah. We just needed a little more time with her, if, if right. the story cares about her. I, I'm not entirely convinced that that was a correct addition, but I don't know, it seems to add. It seems to yeah. add to the theme and to the story in general. Right. So, but if you're gonna do it, you know, give me more than just like two scenes, you know? Yeah, for sure. So then you arrive at Igros Castle. Uh, as Ramza approaches the castle, he sees Zalbag's mount on the outside. He's like, ooh, Zalbag's here, right? Opens the gate and goes in. And um, he, he comes in on a scene where Zalbag is confronting Dice Dark. So Zalbag has his sword drawn, and, and Dice Dark's like, what are you doing? Like, mm, why are you doing? Yeah. And he's like, you. This is intense. He tries to, it's so funny because um, he tries, he, he, like, he like guesses, Dice Dark guesses at the reason Zalbag's mm, upset. Yeah. He's like, this, this is about a larg? Like, ah, uh, yes, yes, that's our right. Our family is in position to rule, and like, he wasn't strong enough to like see the war through, and right. there's all these reasons why I did that. He's like, that doesn't bother me nearly as much at as the all. fact that you yeah. murdered our father, you yes. freaking moron. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, because he, he's, it's indefensible at that yeah. point. It's like, oh, you know about that. He's like, I, I could, no, I didn't. Well, he tries to deny it for a second. Course, and he's like, course, no, yeah. I know what happened. Yeah, yeah. I, I know about the moss fungus. Like, there's no squirming out of this one. Mm -hmm. Like, I know what you did. So he calls in his guards. And Zalbag is surrounded. So he's about to fight off all of the Hokuten Northern Sky guys plus Dice Dark at the same time. But then that's when... Ramza rushes in with the party at the last minute. And so there's this face-off where you and Zalbag are gonna fight together to bring down Dice Dark. It's a really kind of cool, intense moment. Mm -hmm. And then, as you finish that fight, Dice Dark uses the Arosite and transforms into Adralamek the Wrath. There you go. And this is when that demon says, fool of a brother, heed well these words, the last your ears shall hear. Slain by my hand, our father Barbaneth. This war had brought our house its chance to rule. He will but watch as history passed us by. His due I granted him, no more, no less. No sword yet wrought can parry poison's kiss. So I didn't bring this up in the last episode mm. because it was really long and we were going on for a very long time. And it was at the very end. I was like, we just got to get through this. Yeah. Uh, batteries were going to run out. You had to get back on the train. Right. Um, all of the Lukavi speak in a um, in what's called iambic pentameter or pentameter, yeah. which is like a poetic structure uh, that that was used by Shakespeare a lot. Okay. The idea of it is that each line has ten syllables mm. made up of what are called five iams, and an iam is like it, it's a foot, but it means a non-stressed followed by a stressed syllable, and they alternate like that. Interesting. Non-stressed, stressed, non-stressed, cool. non stressed, huh. non-stressed, stressed, all the way up to 10 syllables. That's one line. Wow. Then the next line. So all of the Lukavi in their Lukavi form speak like this. Hmm. And so I was talking a little bit about how their form of speech changes a bit in the last episode. It's yeah, like the, yeah. the way he talks is different yes. in the Lukavi form. And it's because they're using iambic pentameter when they're speaking. They're speaking poetically. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, in, a, in a structure like that um, mm. on purpose, right? So if you count the syllables as they're, as they're talking, you can count all the way up to the 10, and it, it, it always follows that structure. Fool of a brother, heed well these words, the last your ear shall hear. Like, it, it, it all adds up to iambic pentameter if you count them out, huh. right? He would but watch as history passed us by. Interesting. Right? Um, his You'd due, have to say I it granted out. him no less, no more. Wow. Right? So it always adds up to 10 per line. It's almost like you'd have to say it out loud or hear a performance to, to yeah. get, you right. know, the, the full impact of the poetry. Right. 
That's interesting. That's no cool. No sword yet rot can pair, repoisons, kiss. Well, I wonder. That makes me wonder how the Japanese is at those points. Yeah, I, wonder I, how they I was speak. curious about that too, and I, I was. I, I didn't go here. back through the script in even in English in the PS1 version to see if that was there at all. I would not believe. I, I wouldn't think it is. But this is how all the Lukavi speak, right? They always have that ten-syllable per line, non-stressed, stressed, iambic pentameter, and that's that's why they'll do huh. the the abbreviation of certain words like history, right? So to make history. that into a non-stress, yes. stress syllable, ah, they're taking go. out the middle, middle syllable. It's Instead of history, it's history. History, dude. Okay, yeah. so that's like or it's just musical. Or suffering. Yeah. Instead of suffering, it's suffering. So, yeah. So it's just a, 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 like a more musical kind of He would kind of way. but watch as history passed us by. Bam. Ambic pentameter. His due I granted him no more, no less. No sword yet rot can pair, repoisons, kiss. They all wow. have that. Every line of, of every line of Lukavi dialogue in the War of the Lions version follows that iambic pentameter. That is really cool. Yeah, it's awesome. That's really cool. <laughs> iambic pentameter is a type of metric line used in traditional English poetry and verse drama. The term describes the rhythm or meter established by the words in that line. Rhythm is measured in small groups of syllables called feet. Iambic refers to the type of foot used. Here, the iam, which in English indicates the unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable, as in above, pentameter indicates a line of five feet. Hmm. So five iams, an iam is made of a non-stressed, stressed. So five iams per line, okay. iambic pentameter. That is what it's about. And, and the, the, the rhythm of it is kind of like, it's likened to a heartbeat, but dumb. But dumb. Yes, but dumb, exactly. But it, dumb. It's a beat. But dumb. Yeah. So that's one line. But bum, but bum, but bum, but bum, but bum. Two. That is how all the Lukavi speak. That's very cool. In Final Fantasy Tactics. P- PS1. Lines. PS1 does not have that. <laughs> I don't think it would. I don't think so. And as far as I can tell within the Japanese that I've looked at, there's a ton of dot, 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 dots, but I'm not noticing any, any Japanese poetry that's standing out. So. Yeah. So he ends up killing Zalbag, the demon does. And he turns on Ramza and says, so now on you, Ramza, my gaze alights. If we read that in the, the beat. And so on you, Ramza, my gaze alights. Nice. Now no regret a traitor's recompense. It's musical. Yeah. Can so now on you, Ramza, this my gaze alights, now regret a traitor's recompense. It sounds like Shakespeare. Yes. Because this is what he wrote in, like, a lot. Yes, yeah. So it has that Shakespearean feel to it. Nice. When the Lukavi talk. So it's pretty sweet. Um, you kill him. You rush to Mulande. This is the city where Fall Marv went. And High Confessor Marcel is there. They, like, stab him and wound him, but, like, not m- f- fatally. Like, he could still be... He could still be helped. For But it's bit. like, yeah. you're going to buy your life by telling me what I want to know. How yeah. do I open the gate to the Necro Hall? What do I have to do? You know the answer. So you buy your life back by telling me, yeah. basically. And Lafrey's there and Fall Marv is there. Um, he says that uh, the gate is at the lower levels of Orban Monastery, where the game more or less began. It's like you have to go yeah. back to where you began. Nice kind of bookend yeah, yeah, sort yeah, of sure. feel to that. That's where it's at. And He's like, okay, well, what's the spell to release the seal on the gate? Mm. And Marcel says, I don't know that. It's probably in the scriptures of Germanique. Mm. And, and this just frustrates Falmar so much because he's like, Ramza is in my way at every turn. Yep, over and he's over. He's the one who has the scriptures <laughs> of Germanique. Why is it always him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is so stupid, right? So it's like, he's useless to us now. They just kill the high confessor. So the High Confessor was, was bad in that he was plotting to overthrow the kingdom and become powerful himself, but he was not a Lukavi. No, no. He didn't yeah. have an Arasite. So the, the Pope right. of this church was not a demon right. and was not uh, in on that at all. He yeah. just wanted the church to become the, the power or the, the sure, reigning more influential influence and, yeah, in yeah. the kingdom. Um, so they kill him and they leave and you meet him on the way out. 
and he tells you to hand over the scriptures in uh, exchange for his sister's life. Now, of course, Ramza doesn't know they're not going to kill Alma either way because she's going yeah. to be the, the host of the seraph angel, well, the high seraph. They wanted the book and the stones. Yes. And he, <laughs> I guess Ramza negotiated to just give the book. Yes. <laughs> which was kind of funny. Well, he's like, he's like, okay, you give her to me. Let me see her safe first. Yes. Then, you then get, I'll give you all like, the stuff. No, you don't understand how this works. You, yeah. there's, there's no negotiating. Yeah, you yeah. give them over, then I give you your sister. And right. he says, okay, here's the scriptures of Germanique, yeah. laying them down. You don't get the stones until, until I know she's safe. Yes. And he takes the scriptures and he hands it to Lafrey and he's like, is it in there? And he's thumbing through the pages. Ah, it's actually a really simple incantation. Right. Um, we basically like, hey, we, we got, don't need the stones. Okay, hey, now we can. No, they do need the stones. Well, but we can just kill you and get them now. Oh, I we, see. There we you don't go. have to like exchange anymore. Right. What we really needed was this book. This was yeah. for sure the thing we needed. Now we can just get, get the stones off of your corpses, right? Um, anyways, uh, you fight them, and they flee. <laughs> As always, they just warp out. Um, but Ramza asks them a question before it's over. And he, and, he's, and he asks them, why haven't you killed Alma already? It does not make sense that you have left mm -hmm. her alive this long. Yep. And he's, he's intuiting that she has some other purpose for them, right? And uh, he doesn't really, uh, Falmar doesn't give it away, but like Ramza's starting to realize that there's, there's something more going on here. It doesn't make sense that there's just some random yeah. noble girl who doesn't know anything and isn't really that valuable. Like, they've already killed Dice Darg at this point. Like, why are you keeping her alive, right? Yep. You go further down into the cathedral, and this is where he brings Zalbak back from the dead as a zombie to kill you. And what's really interesting about this, I, I really actually kind of like the way they did this. Zalbag is still conscious and aware and himself. But he has yeah, he, there's no a part of him. senses. He has yeah. no sense of sight or smell or touch or anything. He's, sure, he can he's hear. in a black void. I guess, yeah, he can hear yeah. Ramza's voice. And he can, like, control his body to speak back to him. Yes. But he's otherwise in this void of nothingness. Yeah. He can't see what he's doing. He can't control his body. He can't feel anything. And he's just like, oh, Ramza, I don't know what's going on. I can't control myself. Yeah, like, I'm afraid I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Yeah. Run away. Mm. He was the brother who was the military guy, right? He's like, yeah. I'll kill you if you try to fight me. Like, don't try to yeah, fight yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> right? <Yes. laughs> Not Probably not realizing how far Ramza has come. And, and Ramza was, I mean, he did go to the academy. He was trained as a knight. Right, right. right. Um, but you, you basically have to kill him. You're forced to kill him here. So it's a kind of a sad scene. Um, we've already talked a lot about Zalbag. I don't really have that many more notes about him or this. No. We've kind of covered that for the most part. But I, it's a good I, scene. It, it is good. Um, I do have one more note that I forgot as we went past the Pope here. Mm -hmm. um, there was just one last note. Um, so Funeral Iman, and what was his name in War of the Lions? I say Iman. The, the Pope the guy? The Pope. Marcel, yeah. they call him High Confessor Marcel. Marcel, oh, it's Iman. Oh well. That's um, so the That's totally the Pope, and I hate saying Pope because it's not Catholic necessarily, but you know whatever. The guy, the the head of the of the religion, um, he is down there with the sword in his back, and he's asking for help. Oh right? yeah. And he's like, somebody please help me, and uh, we show up. Anyways, yeah. my note here is that the Pope dude asked for help, and prayed. For help, and Ramza showed up. Do you know what's interesting about that? What? Pat Holloman made yeah. a comment on our second episode oh, that yeah. Ovelia did the same thing at the beginning of the game. Ovelia said, "Please, God, save thy sinful chin of evil." Yes, at the very children beginning. Children of evil, Oh, fascinating. And then Ramza yeah. Bale shows up right after there she prays. There you go. For help. How about that? Well, this is we, twice where Ramza has been yes. the response to a prayer from <laughs> Ramza is the answer to prayer, and there is heavy symbolism in that yeah. for sure. But I think it's even more impactful when it's the church, the leader of the church, is asking for help, and then Ramza and, comes, and the heretic, not just Ramza, <laughs> the heretic, yeah. comes. 
to to help out the Pope. Anyways, it's um, interesting stuff. It's interesting yeah. for sure. Yeah, that's that's actually. I'm really glad you brought that up because yeah. that really connects again the end and the beginning of the game. Yeah. Because um, yeah, Ovelia did the same thing. You're like right. First scene of the game, basically. That's fascinating. Okay. Now you go back to Orban Monastery, and this will lead into the ending of the game. Basically the end, yeah. This is my yeah. last little section of notes here. So you're f you fight Lofri down in the fifth level of the monastery. So you're going down, down, down to the depths of the monastery um, where this uh, gate to the Necro Hall is meant to be. And after you defeat him, he opens the gate and sucks you all into it. And then mm -hmm. he breaks the gate on the other side as his like his the, his last ounce of strength, and basically traps you down there. And there's no way back. Mm, yep. It's like you've you've uh, you've fought us all the way here. You've been a thorn in our sides all the way. But now you're trapped, and you're never going back to Evil East. And you die here, or we yep. die here. This is it. Get and rich or die trying. It's a big, <laughs> <laughs> big like uh, finale and kind of like raises the stakes here. It's like, this is the end. Like, there's no going back at this point, right? Yeah. Um, now, I do have to speak about the ease of the fights. If, even if you aren't exploiting the game's abusive abilities, I'll call them yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. If you're not using the arithmetician or the mathematician skills mm -hmm. to just cast magic and hit everybody on a certain level, or that's at a certain you have level range, to each yeah, other. Yeah. There's all these different ways that you can categorize or group similarities of your enemies, mm -hmm. and you can hit a bunch of them with one spell with zero MP cost. <laughs> <laughs> you can cast the most powerful spell you have on yeah, like yeah. five guys on the field and wipe them out, and it doesn't cost you any MP at all. It's great. It it it's, it it is game breaking, but it's great. So even if you're not, I, doing I appreciate that, playing games <laughs> <laughs> like that where you can break it. Yes. Even if you're not doing that, even if you've not abused your monk ninja who can yes, yes, um, yes. first strike Duel. enemies who attack him yeah. and hit him with two hits for Duel, like 500 yeah. apiece and just like massacre anybody. Yeah. Even if you're not doing that, Thunder God Sid himself is abusive enough yeah. in these fights to end them more or less in just, one of them is in one turn, right? Because mm. you fight against Kletian again as yeah. like this first battle after Lafrey. And you can literally just have, because the problem with these battles is the objective in all of them is kill the boss. Yes. It's not yeah, yeah. route the enemy or, right. you know, do this or that. Like like uh, the sluice battle was pull the levers. Right. It's not an objective like that. The objective is kill this one guy. That's it. As soon as you kill that guy, the battle's over. And so it doesn't matter whatever else is going on. No. It's just right Just there. kill yes. that guy. And, so and it's Kletian is like facing you within walking distance of Sid if you place him near Ramza on that yeah. tile. He can just walk over, bling, battle over. Because Sid is just that powerful when you get him. You don't even yeah. have to like do anything. He's just a broken character from the beginning. <laughs> don't call him Thunder God for nothing. They don't call him Thunder God for nothing. Yeah. So if you're going to design a battle like this, where the, the, the goal is to kill the boss, you've got to put the boss like way over here or something. Yeah, And yeah. the boss doesn't move. He doesn't come to you. He doesn't like, the AI is <laughs> keeps him away and makes you fight through a bunch of guys first to get to him. Yes. So a lot of these final battles are kind of disappointing because that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. And it, there's so many ways in which you can just target the guy, even from across the map, or just have Sid run up there and kill them, and it's just, so, the, the, the major complaint that a lot of people have with Final Fantasy Tactics, if they're inexperienced, is the game's too hard. If they're experienced, like the middle, is, this game's yeah. way too easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like both things at once. Yeah. And it's so strange That's probably that a knock to game design, just yeah. in general. Games yeah. shouldn't be like that. So I, I, I agree. I, th yeah. I think that that's the one problem with Final Fantasy Tactics is yeah. the, the, it's too steep difficulty in the first chapter. And then it rounds out, but then there's a really sharp spike at Riovane. <laughs> just and, for a little bit. And then after that, it's just like... Smooth sailing, yeah. It's just, it just like totally dies off completely. And that's when you want your 
most difficult battles at the very is at the end, end. You'd prefer you want to yeah. ramp up to that slowly. Although I kept wondering because one of the few no notes I took here is that there are just tons of battles in a row. Yeah, the lot. Like after, feels after, after new new stage, new form. You know, yeah. just you just keep fighting over and over. And now they're easy, but there's always the thought of okay, but what's the next thing going to be? Yeah, that might not be easy. Right? Yeah. And then when the game's over, it's like, well, I, at least I fought a ton of battles. Yeah. <laughs> they, you know. And so, I mean, a lot of people would even say that it doesn't have a lot of replay value because... Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, unless you're going to do challenge runs, unless you're going to do like a just Ramza run of the game oh, or something dude. like that, right? Like, or something crazy. Yeah, that'd be crazy. Or I'm, on, I'm not going to allow myself to use this class or... Yeah. There, there are ways to kind of like... But some people can't do that. You know, some people are like, I, I don't really want that. Yeah. Um, I want the game to be more organically challenging. Yeah, I have a hard time challenging myself. Yeah. It's too hard for me to fight with a hand behind my back the whole time. And like, <laughs> or, I could just feel use there's my any, other hand. Feel like there's any stakes yes, in yeah. that, right? Yeah. It's like, well, I, this wouldn't be a problem if I weren't doing this. That, that ruins right? it, though. That it, ruins it. it. Yeah. Because you want of, the game to challenge you. You don't want to challenge yourself. That's kind of how I feel. Yeah. Um, but, it, but at the same time, and you mentioned this earlier, some people might think we're being hypocritical. There is something that is also fun about just being breaking god. the game yes. and being god by the I end. do enjoy it. There's a part of that that I like yes. too. <laughs> yes, I enjoy it, but I enjoy the process of doing it. Once it's done, I mean, you, then you just cruise through the story. Yeah, there's no more great, conflict. Which is fine. You're right. The conflict <laughs> is it gra drastically reduces the, the stakes, right? Yeah. Um, but... After a while, that, that does get old as well. Yeah. So, yeah. so, I mean, as with, as with anything with RPGs, when you're talking about them, I think there's a lot of nuance to this conversation. It's not like such an easy thing to say one way or the other. Because yeah. so much of it depends on your, your personal experience and what you figured out and how deep you delved into the mechanics. It's all how you played the game, yeah. And this is the type of game that you won't necessarily be rewarded for like the being this super in-depth uh, exploration of its mechanics. Because you will break mm -hmm. the game if you do that. I was watching a video the other day about, um, it was, it, oh man, I really liked this video. And uh, in fact, I wanna, give, I wanna give credit to the creator of the video and shout him out because I thought yeah. he, he's done like a retrospective series similar to mine on Final Fantasy, but he did it for the entire um, Fire Emblem series. Oh, nice. And um, I, I was just, I was really hooked watching his videos. Um, but I want to make sure, oh, it doesn't list it the same as on, oh man, how do I see a list of my subscribers, of the, the channels I'm subscribed to? Because he hasn't oh, uploaded in a while. Well, if you, oh, jeez. Usually it's like here. Yeah, I'm I, not seeing it. Did you click that and see what happens? Oh, scroll down. Just scroll way down. Oh, here we go. There you go. There he is. So it's Shane Brained. Shane Brained. That's the name of the channel. Shane Brained. Uh, as in like your brain, brain, E-D with it. So yeah. Shane and then brain with an E-D on the end. Shane Brained. So anyways, I was watching his retrospective on... Uh, Fire Emblem Awakening, which is my favorite Fire Emblem game. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm putting together a list right now, a video I'm going to release, a, a, a list of my top 50 favorite video games of all time. And I'm trying to decide where I want these games to fall and which Fire Emblem games are my favorite. And I'm, I'm really putting probably more thought into this than need be done <laughs> on just the, what's what your favorite games. Just list them and talk about them. Yeah. But I was, I was looking into th the two Fire Emblem games uh, one of them I've played a little bit, the other one I haven't touched. The only two, because I've played every other Fire Emblem game there is. A aside from the two Super Nintendo titles that were never remade yet. Mm. So like the original Fire Emblem NES was remade as Shadow Dragon. Oh yeah. Um, I guess Mystery of the Emblem wasn't. It was remade, but it wasn't released in America. It was, re it was remade on DS, but never released here. Anyways, I've played all of them except for Genealogy of the Holy War which I got very excited about in doing research about how that could possibly be a candidate for this podcast. It yes. has a pretty awesome story. Um, and then Thrasia is the one that followed that. So those are the two I hadn't played. And so I was listening to his retrospectives on them and listening to his retrospective on Fire Emblem Awakening. And sorry that this is a really long setup to this, but the point is he talked about the way or how easy it is to break Fire Emblem's difficulty. Uh, there's a there's a 
one of the abilities or the skills called Gale Force or something. And the idea is that if you kill the enemy on that turn, it gives you another turn. Mm. And the game allows you to reclass all the units. So you could send everybody into the Pegasus and grab this ability, and like everyone can then have Gale Force, and then you like pair them together so that you get like two attacks from the guy, from your main guy, and then the person paired with them, which kills them, and then they get another turn. That's cool kill, strategy. Kill, 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 right? Huh. And it's like, oh, this just ruins the difficulty of the game. Okay. And it's so yeah, it's you a can complaint. Abuse it for sure. Now there's. It's a cool mechanic, but. There's other levels to this because he only played the game on its normal and hard difficulty, not on its ludicrous difficulty, the really <laughs> hardest one. And anybody who Why? Hold on. There's normal, <laughs> hard, and ludicrous? Yeah, it's like normal, hard, ludicrous. There's no hard, easy, ludicrous. it's not easy, normal, no, hard. No, that was, a, normal, that was, a, hard, that was a whole problem with one of the previous Fire Emblem games because they called it easy, hard, and or easy, normal, hard. But normal but was really, hard. really, normal was hard. So they and changed. So the it translation for that was bad, and so everyone played. That oh, was the 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 okay. Wii the Wii okay. version, Radiant Dawn. I see. Everyone was like, oh, "I'm not going to play the easy. I'm going to play the normal." But the normal was the hard, and everyone thought it was it was this stupidly hard game, and it got really low review scores because of that. And so when they made Awakening, they wanted to make sure you understood it's normal, hard, really, really hard. <laughs> wow. Right? There is no easy mode in this game. So, anyways. He didn't play that ludicrous difficulty, which is, it's called ludicrous for a reason. It is way, 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 way harder than hard. Hmm. And so things like this being a, 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 um, available to you is probably more of a balancing act for, for that, that difficulty, okay. not for it to be used on hard, right? Mm. So there's, anyways, there's nuance you know, some, to that some criticism. Some games but will allow like an extra move set on after you beat the game. Yeah. Then when you play your new file, you've got unlocked this new right. move. It, that would make a little more sense. If, if you couldn't Instead use this Instead of letting it be in done this mode, in your first playthrough. You, you, you can unlock it in this mode, something like that. Something like That's, that. That's, sure. Anyways, the point is, whether or not something is, because I never mm. thought to do that. Yeah. And I played Fire Emblem Awakening probably three or four times. Oh, no way. It's, it was one of those, it's That's probably funny. the first game I've ever played where I beat it, and I was like, I'm starting that over and playing it again. And yeah. I beat it, and I started it over, and I no played way. it three nice. times nice. back to back to back. That's how nice. much it affected me at the time. Nice. Um, I really, really loved the game. And so, but I never thought to do that. In fact, I don't even think I ever really used the Pegasus class much. Wow. So I, I never really. So it's all dependent. When games have that many classes. Yeah, it is. It's all dependent yeah. on how you played it. Yeah. So Fire Emblem Awakening's difficulty was never broken for me because I never mm. like f discovered an abusive tactic of that kind. Yeah. And I think a lot of people who play Final Fantasy Tactics without knowing the abusive strategies might similarly not have had any problem with this sort of thing. But mm. if you're the person who's going to experiment with every class and every ability and find out what they do, if you're that kind of player, yeah. this might not end up feeling all that rewarding to you yeah. or worth something playing again. But at the same time, it's like, it's kind of fun it is. to become God by the end and just wipe the floor and it find is. the ways. There's almost an, an enjoyment in and of itself of, of exploring how to break it. Well, when I play a strategy game, yeah. It's all, in my opinion, well, this is just how I do it. I try to find the best strategy. What is the best strategy? Mm -hmm. it, the game kind of pushes you in that direction, right? Yeah. You figure out, trial and error, you figure out the best use for every single character and for right. every part, for every item, for every spell. And, like, I don't, I, I can't play a strategy game where the best strategies are available to me, yet I choose not to use them. It, yeah. just, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. But it, the game also pushes me to find out those OP Because it's so hard. <laughs> yeah, well, because especially early on, it's like, okay, like how am I gonna do this? And I really wanna do this in as few turns as possible. Mm -hmm. And I want to expend the least amount of trouble and I don't want any of my people to die ever, you know? And so I really push myself to exploit the game mechanics in order to achieve that. And so, 
however that ends up, I actually feel very proud of myself. Sure. That I, this was a strategy game, and I came up with the best strategy. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like, it's a point of pride. I, I think that could be rewarding in and of itself. Sure. Even if the final boss dies in a turn, it's like, it's because I you figured out exactly. how to do that. It's not I'm just... I'm a genius, yeah. right? Yeah, it's not just that you leveled up your character so high that you're invincible. It's like, no, you thought about this. Yeah. You, you, this is you. This was a skill-based moment, you know? I talked about this, I think, a little bit. I can't remember how much we did in the last episode because it was a week ago, and we talked for like four hours. And, and it's not up yet. This. Yeah. But the battle against Wygref is really hard spike in this game in, yeah. at Rio Vanes. Yes. And I was watching myself play it as I was reviewing the scenes. And he was mm -hmm. wiping the floor with me because my Zodiac compatibility was really good for him. Uh, of course. So he was doing additional damage to me where yeah, he could yeah. wipe me out in two turns. And I was like, how on earth do I survive this battle? This is crazy. So I'm in the menus afterwards. I'm watching myself kind of do this. And I, I, I was trying to remember what my rationale was behind this. Because I took off his armor and put really bad armor on him on purpose. Oh, really? And I was like, what am I doing? Like, why did I, why did I exchange that armor for that? That's going to lower his health, which means he'll die faster. Like, why would I do that? Yeah. And then I put on a passive skill or a, re a reaction ability that was critical HP healing. So you would go to critical quicker. I was purposefully yes, yes. L yeah. allowing him to put me in critical mode so I would get a full heal and I would loop the battle like that. Perfect. So that why, every time Wygriff attacked me, I just healed anyways. But that, see, that a strategy game is asking for you to do yes, things like that. because I couldn't it's beat him any other way. And, He's and too that's, strong. And that's okay. <laughs> yeah. And that's okay because that, whatever the best strategy is, you're going to find it. And so I don't even consider it game breaking. If the yeah. game lets you do it and it's a strategy game. Right. That's just good strategy. Yeah, because the other part of it, too, is that bravery, however, whatever your level of bravery is, mm -hmm. is almost like the percentage uh, yes. chance that reaction ability will actually mm -hmm. work. So I buffed my bravery all the way up to 100 so that it was a for sure thing. That Anytime you would heal he hit me, I would heal. Time. And then I could nice. sit there and buff my speed and buff whatever else Everything I wanted else, yeah. for the next phase of the fight. And I was nice, fast enough nice. to get two turns in so I could just go kill Belios right away mm, yes. before he gets a turn at all. So it's like I was letting Wygraf just sit there and hit me for like 30 <laughs> minutes uh, while I healed automatically and just buffed myself yeah. to freaking high heaven so that I could just take out the Belius form in one turn. <laughs> so, yeah. like, uh, that's cool. It is cool. That's cool. And it's a creative solution. Right. It's creative to think, to, to use a move like that and to um, reduce your own, it's like every now and then you're playing f like in an NFL game, right? Yeah. It's, it's like third down and they purposefully take the penalty because they're too close to the field goal post. Right. right? They're on the one and they got to kick a field goal, but that's, uh, the angle's awkward. So you purposefully take a penalty so that you have a better angle. Right. It, it's like you purposefully decrease your odds, but it actually ends up increasing anyways. It's just good strategy. Right. It's just good strategy. So anyways, hopefully, that can start a, a discussion kind of about like difficulty in strategy games or in RPGs in general. Yeah. I, don't, I never really I think give much... strategy games in particular, though, I'm okay with this, whereas RPGs, it's not asking for you to do the same things. A strategy game is <laughs> asking do, for you to don't. break yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Kind of depends. Like Shin Megami Tensei is very different from... It's more complicated, right? Super Mario RPG. <laughs> yes, like that, of, right? course. <laughs> of course. Of course. Anyways, okay. I, I never really give much weight to this idea of, ah, oh, this RPG is too easy. It should be harder. It's like, how experienced are you, the person who's yeah, saying this? Yeah. How many RPGs have you played in your life? Probably like well over 100. Probably 100, yeah. You, you, can't, you can't approach something being like, this should be designed for me. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be designed for as many people to buy the game exactly, as possible. Exactly, yeah. Hopefully, they can. The designers can keep you in mind and give you an added difficulty mm -hmm. level or something like something that. Like the difficulty, that. Seems or to make sense. if it's vagrant story, I guess he's just going to tell you this is for the hardcore and no one else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, so maybe seek out those experiences oh, that are here like and there. Are fun, but though. anyways, that's okay. enough about gameplay. I think. Well, um, you fight Saint through Dejora. Kletien, You fight through. Fall or Barak, who's also after that. Mm. So you fight all like the Knight Templars, who were yeah. all secretly Lukavi people. 
and you get down to Falmar. And you have to fight everyone twice because then they die, then they get resurrected <laughs> as a demon, and then you kill them again. So Falmarv. Yes. He's the final battle here. He has Alma with him. Um, and he starts to share some doubts. That, like, is she really the vessel? Because he's trying to resurrect Ajora and it's not mm. working. Right. And he's trying to figure out why that is, right? Like, what's going wrong? And this is where you arrive. And then it dawns on him, oh, there has to be a blood sacrifice. Um, he just started. <laughs> Like that's the first it's thing like, you try. You're a Satanist trying to resurrect, well, you know, the, the ultimate <laughs> demon. <laughs> Blood sacrifice, man. That's that's like step one. True, <laughs> but for the rest of them, they just had to use the stone. It's just that's like, true. Yeah, yeah. I evoke the power of the stone. I make the covenant with the, the, the voice, and yeah. bam, I, it works. So to the so. church's credit, at Glabados, right? Yeah, they hadn't been doing blood sacrifices for a while. <laughs> Probably it not. That it didn't occur to, to his mind to do that. So it's like, okay, well, the church wasn't all the way gone. Well, right? I guess he's a demon at this point, so he should have oh, yeah. occurred to him. Yeah, because he's already been taken over. Oh. Anyways, right. he realizes there needs to be a blood sacrifice. So you fight against him in his Hashmal form. Hashmal. Hashmal, the, he's got like a lion yes, yeah, yeah. kind of like look to him. Um, but in that battle, he ends up giving his own blood, right? Because you kill him. Mm-hmm. And he uh, that that finishes the requirements of the the, the sacrifice, and yeah. so now Ultima can um, possess Alma's body. Um, your defiance reaps you not, but death's embrace. I love that line. Your def- your defiance reaps not, but death's death's embrace. Right. So it follows that yeah. that iambic pentameter structure. Um, so yeah, you have to fight, but th- th- there's almost something that happens where the body gets split. It's like Alma ends up normal over here, and then Ajora is here, in, like the white-haired. Yeah, yeah. Well, at first Alma's kind of fighting the presence in her body, but yeah, yeah at some point there's a split or something that happens. I there. don't really quite understand how or why that works, but like, because that's not know. what happened with any other people. Maybe no. it's because Alma is a good-hearted person where the rest of them ah. were evil and they were able to be possessed. So she fought the possession somehow because okay. she wasn't an evil heart to begin with. Right. I don't know how it creates a separate body when they split. I don't. Someone right. else will have to explain how that works. I, I was a little bit confused by that. But Alma is normal Alma over here, and then you have the white-haired Alma-looking person yeah. who is a Jora Same Ultima. Around, yeah who you fight as the final boss against some other demons. And, um, anyways, there's a second form to that. Yeah. The, the final form grows wings and it's pretty cool design and everything like that. There's not much to say about it. I didn't take that many notes. It's kind um, of a I cool didn't final either. Fight. I went from tons of vows in a row to, wow, please explain that ending to me. <laughs> That's my next no. I kind of skipped over everything. Because as soon as we kill it, I'm, I mean, Ultima, it's not obvious what happens, right? Yes. I mean, it seems like the whole screen turns to white or something. and you're, Everything you're, blows up. Yeah, you're on a, a ship in, like, the deep underworld, <laughs> and y- you just don't really know exactly what happens, right? But then the game's, like, sort of over. Yeah, well, of. then you get the scene at the funeral. They're having a funeral yes! for Alma. Yes. And they're like, oh, she died so young. Oh, what a tragedy. Oh, they never found Ramza's body. How, what a horrible yes, yes. end. As for soon as they old. say that, it's like, oh, they're still alive. Yeah. Which and I would assume anyways. But. Oren uh, shows up with flowers at the, at the grave site with Falmar, or Valmafra, sorry, Valmafra, not Falmar. Yeah. Um, and they kind of, and he, Oren sort so of So Delita talks to did the grave. not kill her. No, he didn't. That, so that's, that's the reveal. reveal there that Delita didn't yes. kill Valmafra, right? Which is kind of nice. Yes. Um, but Oren goes on to basically, um, you know, just kind of let you know what the situation is. Delita has become king. Yeah. He's married Ovelia. So she's queen and he's the king. And um, things are calming down now. Like, mm. you know, we're getting back to like kind of a better, things are on the up in the kingdom, so to speak, right? Um, yeah. He says, when Volmafra revealed herself for an agent of Melande, he made it appear as though he'd kill her, then let her run. 
I think he must have caught a glimpse of himself in her, a tool manipulated by Lord Falmouth. Mm, so he go. was gonna kill her, but then he saw himself a little bit. Yeah. So he, it's so interesting with the Lita because there have been moments when he has gone past the threshold of becoming what what was what he hated, but, but then in certain moments he's able to stop himself. It seems like in the moments where he doesn't have to kill the person, he yeah. doesn't have to. Yeah. Like any time he felt like he had to, that was that. But in a moment like this or some of the others, it's like, well, he did, he didn't, he could still accomplish what he wanted without killing them. And there was really not much of a threat at all. Yeah. And it was in those moments that sometimes, it's like 50 50, I guess, flip a coin. But sometimes he would still kill innocent people that way. Uh, but sometimes he wouldn't, I don't know. But it, those, they would seem like those were the times. He never wavered when it came to his mission. Mm hmm what he was actually trying to accomplish. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, he also never learned about the fate of his father. All those people, Agrius, anyone who went with you. And so it's a big mystery. And, and so he's kind of asking it like, uh, did my father make it out? You know, because uh, Sid was with us. Yeah. And it's like, as he's in the middle of saying this, Ramza and Alma just like run past on Chocobos, like right past them. <laughs> yeah. And he, that makes him wonder, though, like, am I seeing ghosts? Yes, That's kind yep, of the yep, part yep. that makes this ambiguous, this ending. Yeah. And it's actually a point of contention, and it's meant to be, I think it's a little bit meant to be um, left up to in the interpretation of the player. Yeah. Whether or not they all perished in the Necrohall and died, or whether or not they found a way out but just left Ivalice. Yeah. Um, there are, there is, uh, Direct quotes, quotes from Matsuno, which I will read um, to give his official version of that. Okay. Uh, but there's also, if you want to, if even if you wanted to say that he left the company, and so like Square Enix gets to decide like the true canon yeah. of this, right? Yes. Even if you're that person, Ramza appearing in Final Fantasy XIV's Evilise raids is also. I haven't played him, so I don't know this, but apparently it's also some kind of confirmation that he survived oh, really? the okay. events of Final Fantasy Tactics okay. and lived on after it. So, in short, um, yeah, the answer is that they survived, if you right. ask Matsuno or if you believe the Ivalice raids. Yeah. But I think well, at the time this came out, it was left unclear, yeah. and um, people could kind of like debate what which version they liked better, whether they died and he was just seeing ghosts, or whether mm. Alma and uh, Ramza just left everything behind and went to uh, set up a village for people to come and like find refuge from suffering in the wars and things like that. Okay. During the credits, there's a cut scene, there's a scene that plays kind of with the mm -hmm. chocobos running. Yeah, and they have a nice one, a new redone one in War of the Lions as well, where they're running through fields on the chocobos as okay. the music plays. And um, and I copied down That's what I'd heard. the whole thing that Arislam writes at the end because it's oh yes, there's a little there's a quote there at the end. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. so good the way it's written. It's so yeah. beautiful the way that this all comes together. The ending of this game is so strong. Uh, first of all, the music is just, I mean, top of the line S tier, like credits music, yeah. ending music. No, it's beautiful. It's very good. So good. Yeah, it's like movie style. Yeah. Um, so, anyways. Oren is saying, oh my gosh, I just saw them running past and f I think Valmafra's kind of like, what, what, what is going on? Like, what do you think? Mm. He's like, oh, they survived or whatever. Or he's, you know, wondering that. But he promises to tell Ramza's story and so that Ramza will uh, not yes, be yes, forgotten yes. in this, right? Yeah. That's what he makes his promise at the grave. Is yeah. like, you were really the hero of this war and, but no one's going to remember you, but I'm going to make sure they do. Mm -hmm. So Oren uh, vows to write that history and publish it and make sure that it's known that what his role was. That's what are the Durai papers. Yeah. That Arislam is revealing for the first time many, many yeah. years, many hundreds of years later probably. You know what's fun about that is that that just, that parallels the, the Germanique book yeah. in that everyone thinks one thing happened and then one writing gets uncovered some many, yeah. many years later that kind of throws it into question. Right. And it's, um, it's almost another bookend kind of thing, but yeah. I guess the Germanique shows up around the middle. But well, it's chapter a, two. It's a yeah. motif ish of sorts, but yeah. it's pretty it's pretty cool. Right. So this is now Arislam's narration as 
Alma and uh, Ramza are sort of riding off into the sunset yeah. on their chocobos through the Just fields. Visiting different places. Yeah. yeah. As, as they're doing that, he says, Ramza and his sister were not seen again. Oren Durai was left to ponder the mark they had left on history's page. I know not what brings men joy, of what drives them to great deeds, of what legacies they hope to leave. I know a lot less yet. But I do know this. The true hero of this tale was the man forgotten. Oren would spend the next half decade assembling an account of all to which he had borne witness. His work complete, Oren presented this account, the Durai Papers, before the Clemen uh, Clemenzian Council, then convened for the selection of a new High Confessor. However, the Church, fearing above all else the revelation of the truth, seized uh, Oren as a heretic and burned him at the stake. Mm. So the church tried yeah. to keep it a secret that they had been infiltrated by Lukavi during this time. Yeah. Well, they kind of had no choice. They yeah. would have to. The pen that inked them forever stilled, the papers then lay hidden for long centuries, forgotten even by the church that had concealed them. But I have found the truth, and so lay it for all to see, that his deeds might guide generations to come, that his name might receive the honor it's due. And it's signed... Arislam Durai. Durai. And you learn that he's the descendant, descendant. of Oran Durai. Nice. And I, I thought that was a really cool way to reveal that. Yeah. It's like Oran wanted to tell the story that was written by the sword. Mm -hmm. The church silenced him and put it into the stone where it was forgotten. And then his descendant is the one who brings it so the story can be told at the end nice. of all this. Yeah, that's poetic. super poetic way to end it. Um, just freaking amazing. I, I I love the way that's written. I love, I love. Well, actually, let's do the last scene before we get into this because there's a the post, -credit a post credit scene. scene. Yeah, that's really the one that I need to explain. But so, Delita yeah. is writing to. Actually, was this the place? Where they had sort of... It's where she hugged him. Yeah, yeah. earlier, where he was mm -hmm. mocking her and stuff. It's yes. like that place. It's the, yeah, where that's and he, and he's like, oh, I thought you might be here. Yeah. And he's bringing flowers to her. Yes. This indicates to me something happened, and she he's ran away, and he's trying to apologize yeah, yeah. to her. He's yeah. like trying to make it up. Okay, that sounds about right. And she's furious. She says, how could you? You used them and all the others, and someday you'll cast me aside just as you did them. Yep. And she stabs him with a knife. And he's like looking down at this, and he, he, he sort of takes the knife out of himself, and he stabs her back and kills her. And the, the flowers, the flowers sitting right, fall around right on the her. ground next to him. Yeah. And, and then he kind okay, of so is that's... wounded, and he falls to his knees, and he, he asks to the ether, but to Ramza, right? Did you get your end in all of this, Ramza? I got this. And this is where it brings it all together. Yeah. Delita did whatever it took to reach his ends. And the price that he had to pay was that he could not genuinely love or be loved yeah. because of it. He yeah. gave up his humanity, in a sense. He could not be trusted by his wife yep. or anyone else. Anybody. And he used everybody, even those close to him, for his ends, and it turned everybody against him. Mm -hmm. That was the price of the consequentialist attitude. Yeah. Ramza he, yeah. gave up power. Mm -hmm. He was willing to let it go. Yeah. And in return, he found love of everybody. Everybody trusted him, joined his cause, saw his honor, uh, wanted to follow him. He earned the love and adoration in exchange for giving up the privilege and station and power. Right. And so this is the result of the two paths, right? The tragic paths of friends that, that go opposite directions and try different ways to achieve the ends. Yeah. And, and, and. Delita was the one honored and remembered mm -hmm. in legend and history, and Ramza yeah. was forgotten entirely, and he was okay with that. It did not bother yes. him that all the sacrifices he, didn't care he made about the legacy, were yeah. not remembered. 
didn't care. Yeah. And it, it, that brings the whole theme really to a close in a very powerful way in a really sad scene yeah. in the end. And it's, it just leaves you feeling like, oh man, like that sucks. But at the but same time, feel for it. <laughs> there was no other ending. There was yeah. no other way for Delita's story to end. Yeah. It, it, and you knew it as, as the story was going and you were watching him kind of make these decisions and slowly descend into, you know, monsterhood. Yeah. Uh, you know that this is how it's going to end. Yeah. You just, you know it, you feel it. And the only hope of redemption for him was that moment where I said that clouded everything, where it was, is, it's Ophelia, right? Ophelia, yep. Ophelia, where she maybe can bring him out of it, you know? And for a minute, it looked like it would it work. It seemed like it could happen. In the end, it did not. But in the end, it did not. And honestly, the, he had gone too far mm-hmm. at that point. And there was nothing that could be done. Um, so, yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, I said, I like him asking what Ramza got. I mean, especially after we saw Ramza and Alma traveling the world together, happy together, being forgotten and forgetting and not having a care in the world about anything. Mm -hmm. And then Delita, who in the end gets nothing, right? And even his legacy after time is erased as well and and will be replaced with Ramza. So the rabbit in the hare, right? Or tortoise in the hare, there you go. The tortoise in the hare. in the end, Ramza is the one who w- whose story will be told for yeah. a long time. Delita right. had his time, but it's over, it's gone, and he will now be cast aside to the pages of history as, as he has died. And Ramza's story is the one that will now be remembered. And it's because he lived a principled life, you know? Yeah. He did what was meaningful to him yeah. instead of the what he whatever he could do required. to get more power or yeah. yeah or whatever he was required to do or whatever sacrifices needed to be made he would sacrifice himself not other people yeah so and so i started thinking about this a little more it's like okay what what context can i draw from the game to give me a clue as to what Ovelli was so upset about that she would try to kill Dewey? Mm, what could did that you find be? it cuz well, i could my really theory tell. is she learned that Oren was burned at the stake for trying to tell the story oh. of Ramza. And that Delita may have allowed this to happen for the sake of keeping the peace and the yeah. control of the people. And it did not intervene to save Oren and allowed the church to kill him. Or possibly, well, let's go all the way, <clears throat> maybe even told them to do it or, or right. was part of some sort of council. Yeah. Because he would have been the king at this time. I know, he could have stopped it for sure. Or he and so when yeah. she learns that he did nothing or maybe even gave the blessing to allow Oren to be burned at the stake to keep yeah. Ramza's story a secret and keep the church from mm. um, suffering the, the, um, the consequences of their role in the War of the Lions, mm. I could see her getting mad enough to try to kill him. That sounds about right, because the, yeah. the moment that, that Oren is in um, Ovelia's, was it her room? It was, it was in the, the castle, yeah. She in the castle? In, like in the key. That area. he tells her, he says, I will not kill him. Yeah, right. I made you a promise can trust me. that I won't kill him. That would be the thing. And that would be breaking that, that promise, be ultimately using Oren. years before. So she says, how could you, right? You used them and all the others. You used Ramza, you used Oren, you used all these people who died to make it so you could be the king of Ivalice and now you've allowed Oren to be burned at the stake. Mm. And as soon as I'm inconvenient to you, you usually throw me to the side as well. And she's not wrong. She's not wrong at all. And she's she's furious enough to try to stab him, to try to kill him because of this. And... He hangs in there. He survives the wound, but he kills her to keep the secret secret. <laughs> and that's just crazy oh, to me. Yeah. But it was also that the peace of Ivalice can be kept. He'll do anything and, for that. And to keep his power to make sure that and that's the, the case. In some strange way, like it, I suppose it worked. They don't clue you into much in terms of how's the... How's the empire doing at this point? How how is the yeah. how's Ivalice doing? Are they back right. into war still, or is everything peaceful now? Yeah. Did he did he get what he wanted or not? And it sounds like no, it sounds like he's still having to like 
it sounds like they're still fighting wars. Things haven't changed because he feels as if the, when he asks Ramza, what did you get? It sounds like he hasn't achieved what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He got the kingship, he's the king now, but now he's presiding over the slaughter and the oppression. And, he, and that's not what he wanted to do, but it's what he has to do to stay in power. Yeah, and he, right? can't, he can't have a relationship, a genuine relationship no, with anyone, because no. nobody can trust him. <laughs> <laughs> and he, that's what he gets in the end for what he did. Yeah. Like that's the fate, that, that's what you get for having a, a, anything justifies the end's attitude. You know what's funny? So this is an interesting way of looking at it. Um, what he got in the end was the situation is no longer any different, mm -hmm. but now he's responsible for it. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So you start off, I'm gonna end all the wars, and what ends up happening is you're the one who's responsible for all the wars. Mm -hmm. and. That's like nothing's changed technically, but you have dragged yourself to hell and gotten nothing in return. Yep. And no one's any better off. Jeez. And I say here, very sad story. Very sad story, though his story could only have ended sadly. Yeah. That was the only possible option. Yeah. And I remember we talked a little bit last time about how some people would lament the um, magic and the divinity within the game. Yeah, oh, yeah. That the, the sort of supernatural side of yes, it. Yes, and yeah. saying, why can't we just have some killer, hardcore political intrigue without all this magical nonsense, right? Yeah. Or maybe not magical, but the... Um, the supernatural elements. Just the, the supernatural. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, all that stuff. The gods and everything. The Dukawi. And um, I did, we didn't talk about it as much because we hadn't gotten to the end of the game, but this is just an example of a story that is only focused on the political intrigue and nothing else. Yeah. That's Delita's story, yeah. and this is how it ends. Yeah. And it sucks. <laughs> it's not a good story. And unfortunately, this is reality. It's a real story, yeah, though. This is as real a story as exists, is Delita's yeah. story, because he ignored any additional help from anywhere else. He just did his own thing and played the Game of Thrones and, and won. He won. Good job. He won. But what does he really win? <laughs> he wins a crap sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> he wins nothing. Whereas Ramza takes the path of enlightenment, the path of, of, of the sacrifice divine. The path of sacrifice. Humility. Yeah, something more along the lines of the path of Christ, right? Yeah. And he ends up with, in, a, in a better place. Yeah, much better place. Um, but that, that requires a notion of, of divinity and of supernatural you know, powers and things, if, if you're going to have that kind of a story for Ramza. Uh, but if you want the story without Ramza, but you want it to end all nice and happy, it's just not going to be realistic. Right. It's going to end the way that Delita's ended. And I mean, there are stories like that. And sometimes your, your games have a sad ending, and that's fine. But typically those aren't the uh, AAA RPGs <laughs> that are made for a 14-year-old audience. Yeah, you know? the reading tragedies or whatever is, well, yeah, I guess those can be really popular and Romeo and I've Juliet seen like, well, maybe like I that, shouldn't give away the games of some of the ones I was going to mention, but there are games like that that are still fun. Sure. Um, but, I mean, it's a conflicting feeling to end on. I like so. feeling conflicted at the end of the story. <laughs> sure. I well, like it In this story, you get both. <laughs> I like you it. You get both, and it's amazing. I enjoy that. I enjoy being challenged by yeah. the story. I enjoy being at the end and, and not feeling super resolved by it all, but being, yeah. having to work through that and like... I didn't when I was a teenager though. <laughs> yeah, and I think that you're right. I Most do Most people probably don't. Yeah. Most people are looking at this for entertainment value and they exactly. want to feel good yeah, yeah. when it ends. Right? You want the good guy to win, right? I, it's not exactly common to want to feel sad if you beat a game. <laughs> yes. Anyways. Anyways, I just thought I'd bring that up again. Now that we've gotten through Oof. everything here, I have to say that this is... This has got to be top five best stories ever told in a video game to me. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I, I feel like it is in that complete upper echelon. It's up there. Abso it's absolutely, absolutely up there. In a game. I'd have to think about it, but probably, probably me too, top it's five. It's really good. Yeah, it's so good, and it's the way that it's told. It's mm. not just the story itself. It's a great story, beautiful story. Yeah. But the way that it's told and the conciseness. Like I've told you in the past, um, I tend to, I don't actually use the platform, right? But I tend to visit Twitter mm. as opposed to a blog or a, a Facebook post or something mm. like that. I tend, I really value 
when people are capable of delivering their message in a very succinct manner, yes. right? And of course, there's the idea that true understanding comes from, um, well, you can demonstrate true understanding by taking a complex um, like idea and explaining it so that a five-year-old can understand it, right? Yeah, that, right? That's how you really know you got a grasp on it. Right. Well, a similar thing happens within a video game. You really have, you've really gotten your story in a good spot when you can adequately tell it with great impact in such short cutscenes yeah. and such little text. Right. And like, this game pulls that off. And so it's not just the story, even though the story is so good and really good. Um, it's the way that they pulled it off. It's just, it's kind of yeah. unbelievable that yeah. they were able to pull it off. But it's yeah. incredible. It's very um, good. This got me thinking a little bit about how do you qualify if a story is good? Or like, what, what would you say makes a story good or whatever? Okay. And there's all would kinds of elements. There's like style factors into it, right? Like sure. The style, sure. It has to match with how, what you're saying. How they go about. But to, because yeah. uh, uh, this was something I've been thinking about since Xenogears actually. Because there were so many Xenogears fans who, I don't know, they have this attitude that like never really sat well with me. Again, yeah. this is not all Xenogears fans or anything like that. It's oh, just sure. there's a subset who claim Xenogears can never be topped because most stories don't tell a, 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 as complex of a plot as Xenogears. If it doesn't have this I sort of the point. weaving complexity, yeah. right, then it's not as valuable or as deep mm. or as important as something else. Deep, and maybe, but the other adjectives, I knew no. that I disagreed with that sentiment, yeah. but it wasn't clarified to me why in a way that I feel like I could articulate until now. Because to me, that's, that's part of style, or it's part of like one of many elements. But to me, the core element, this is my personal opinion, the number one thing is how did you execute on the theme? Yes, me too, me too. And me it too. doesn't matter if the plot is as bare bones and simple mm -hmm. and as uh, done over and over again, We've all seen this before. I don't care what the plot is at all. Yeah. As long as the theme, the message that the writer is trying to get to you is executed in a way in which it lands with impact. Yeah. And you go, oh, think about that. Wow, I, that changes my perspective. Or I wonder about how this applies. If, if a story's mm. message is clear, and it's executed in a way that gets you to really consider or think or feel something about it. That to me means it's a good story regardless of its complexity. Sure. Regardless of many of the stylistic choices made. Yeah. That's it. And this is why something like this to me is a better story than Xenogears. Xenogears is also one of those all time it's, top shelf it's best there. stories of all yeah, time. Yeah, it's very good but the execution of that story is sloppy from time to time and yeah. can make it kind of a mire to swim through to find. And some people like that. Some people are like, it, you know, you have to play the game multiple times. You have to really think about it harder. And that's all fine and good. But personally, I appreciate when the execution is so tight mm -hmm. and so consistently yep. perfect that you come out of it and, and, and there, your first experience with that is just this high level. Because my first experience with Xenogears was, what? <laughs> and mine <laughs> would have been. Mine Wait a minute, been. what happened here? I don't really get it, yeah. right? And I had to spend all this time in ancillary works and mm -hmm. other things and talking to other people and seeing mm -hmm. the things I might have like, you know, not quite like picked up on, yeah. explained back to me. Oh, okay. And then playing the game the second time it all came together. Now again, I'm telling you, this is also up there in that it upper is. echelon top it ten. Is. Xenogears yeah. is fantastic, amazing. It's it's the kind of game that has way more to talk about than this, yes. which is why we have done this in five episodes, episodes yeah. versus twenty one episodes. Yes, yes. It's way deeper yeah. and probably more profound thematically and ambitious thematically. All of that is true, but to me, that's not the indicator of what makes it good. 
what makes it what makes a story good is did it execute on theme? Both did. This executed on theme way better than Xenogears did. I think so. Execution, how yeah. they presented it, the clarity of yeah. it. The, Every single scene, with the exception of the famous one, yes, um, is pointing towards that to theme. It. Yeah. And to me, that's why Matsuno is the best storyteller I've ever seen mm. in video games. I think that he is so locked into that. He knows what he's doing. He knows the end. He knows where he's going. And everything along the way is contributing towards the path to that end. Mm. And that's, to me, the mark of a great storyteller. And this is like an almost, it's just a total master class on how to do that. Yeah. And I love the game for that reason. And so this is probably my favorite story in all the video games. Um, it's just unfortunate the gameplay has as many problems as it has, yeah. and it makes it difficult for me to want to replay it necessarily. Oh, sure, yes. Whereas yeah. something like Final Fantasy VII or even Xenogears, I have a lot mm -hmm. easier time thinking about, yeah, I'll replay that again. Yeah, yeah. The, the one thing maybe about a story that is so succinctly told is that you are unlikely to learn new things each time you play it. Yeah. Um, whereas with Xenogears, you're going to find something, something you didn't every notice time. every single time. <laughs> yeah. And and to some extent, it's like, well, that's that could be a detriment because the game's a little too dense. Well, right. okay, fine. That could be a criticism. Uh, with Final Ta Fantasy Tactics, uh, density is not the issue for right. sure. Um, but the the explicit nature of the theme and the way that it was conveyed is, yeah. is just A+. Plus. And it, in some ways, it's like... You know, a game that doesn't need to be played a second time yeah. means that it was executed better the <laughs> Probably, first time, yes. right? Um, yes. It no, doesn't I, require a second playthrough to yeah. understand it. Yeah. Because if, if you need a second playthrough, then it's like, well, maybe things could have been done differently. Yeah. Uh, tactics does not require that. And uh, it, just because a game needs a second playthrough, doesn't. it's not a huge knock against it, but it is a slight knock against it. Yeah. That there could have been some tweaks made to not ne necessitate a second playthrough. Yeah. Um, and of course, I'm not including Nier and games like sure. that in this because those right. do necessitate they, they do second necessitate. playthrough. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, su the succinctness of this story is part of what lends it just so well to to be such a good game. It's so it's easier to digest, but the theme is not for children. You know, yeah. it's it's easy, but it's not childish. I, yeah. I just loved it. Yep, fantastic game, love it. Uh, All time classic. Yep. Now it's time to. Uh, I'd never beaten it before. This super, was the first time I beat the game, game and I'm very happy. Okay, so now it's time to go over some comments from our Patreon and things like that, uh, questions that people had uh, regarding the game or just other topics they wanted us to talk about, and this mm -hmm. is where we'll wrap up uh, for this episode. Um, so let me pull it up. We have... We got about 45 minutes. So. We got a lot. We, we're not going to get to all of them. I'll try my best, but um, that, that's never the case. We have a lot of very um, deep thinking people who watch us, and, and we, they ask very poignant yes. questions that require a great length of time yes. to respond to. Which we love. We, we love, love those that. questions. They're yes. so good, but that means we can't get to all of them. Can't get to every one of them because of just uh, it's just a time issue. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see here. This one's a pretty easy one. We can do this one quick. This one's from Carlos Blanco. Do you believe that Square will ever return to the Evil East world in a future standalone game? Yes, they will. I think, I they, think, will. I think they will. Yeah, they've, um, with Final Fantasy XIV, I think they've shown that they're interested. Yeah. If so, would you rather the past be explored FF12's time or the future post-FF Tactics? The oh, setting seems gosh. too rich with potential and story to just be left behind. I don't actually know. That's like 50-50 to me. I love 12 so much, and it's so cool. But tactics, man. I, I think I that like was, was the impressive. tactics time period a little. That setting yeah. is a little more appealing to me than 12's. Yeah. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be complaining either way, to be honest. Me neither. I <laughs> love like, Ivelisse, past or future, either way. Do whatever you want. Ivelisse is great. Right? Yeah. This one comes from Francisco. Or Francisco. Why do you think that so many other games do not have the same level of quality in their writing as Final Fantasy Tactics, especially War of the Lions edition? I mean, the nuances of the plot, how characters interact with each other, the little details that make them feel like real people with real struggles, and the cleverness of the translation. 
not because of the style of English, even though I love that style. Seems to me that even though the gaming industry has grown so much, too many games uh, still struggle with their writing so much compared to how far video games have come in other areas. Hmm. I don't think games um, put much emphasis on, on the writing. I think they should. I, I don't think they do. Yeah. I think specifically the game producers and the executives say, we're it's, marketing to 13-year-olds. Don't make it compli- Don't overcomplicate well, it. Well, think about some of the best-selling video games of all time. They, they're not even story-driven games. Call anyways. of Duty. And, they're yeah. multiplayer, competitive. FIFA. Online games. Yeah. You know, for the most part. So yeah. it's like, it's not probably given the weight in this, as far as deciding how do we create something that will sell really well. Right. I, I think uh, Khalid here wrote a response that more or less is my opinion as well. He says, in my opinion, the industry still underestimates the importance of good writers and isn't as demanding when recruiting writers as it is with other roles like animators or programmers. That's more or less my point, yeah. Yeah. I believe great writers are the rarest and hardest people to find. Many games excel in most areas except for the writing, which comes off as underwhelming or decent, but by the book. Also, I think the industry does not make efforts to teach the people who work in it how to write well. Mm. You can find presentations and resources on game design, animation, and other areas, but not as much for writing. Writers are a sort of are sort of expected to be competent enough at their job when they are hired. Mm. So there's probably just not tons of emphasis put on it. Like they're saying, um, it's probably not like the most key aspect to a game's financial success. Yeah. And that's probably why. And, and also a lot of games are not story-driven single-player experiences at all. They're Fortnite and League of Legends and Call yes. of Duty and... FIFA, like so, those sorts of things. So a game that could afford a talented writer mm-hmm. is a game that sells 20 million copies like Fortnite. Sure. Whereas a game that needs a talented writer is a game that sells less than a million because yeah, that's they, just they the nature struggle to break of these through, games. Or there's, yeah. a, there's at least a, a risk. I mean, every involved. now and then you'll get a Last of Us or something that just breaks through and everyone loves it. But most yeah. of the time, the narrative games are not well or they're not they don't sell as well and writers are expensive a good writer who yeah. could otherwise be writing books or movies uh, it's expensive you yeah. know I think those, those are pretty good thoughts on that yeah. uh, this one comes from Drafter so I like to play along with you guys as the podcast comes out I'm watching episode 3 as we speak which only gets us up to the end of chapter 2 we still have chapter 3 and 4 to play I'll be waiting uh, so this we're releasing this a couple weeks after having recorded it, right? Yeah. The three just came out as of like yesterday, yesterday at the time of recording this. I don't know yet if I'm going to have questions because I'm only halfway through the game. I felt this way with your Mass Effect podcast as well. I get the importance of getting a bunch of videos ahead, but I'm not likely to have questions or comments till we get to the end. I'm curious if anyone wow. else feels that they're missing out. So I wanted to address this. Um, you can still leave your questions in the Mm. comments of the fifth video and I will try to come in and write a text answer to it. True. Um, Uh, Otherwise, we do uh, do something of a QA and a on Patreon um, at the end of each month. Yeah, so we have... might change a little bit. You're already a patron here, so you will have access to our monthly exclusive podcasts that we do for the supporters. And sometimes those are about the game we just played and those are, yeah... So you can ask your question there if you want. If you're not supporting us and you, you can't afford to do so and you still would like to have your question considered, f- I mean, feel free to ask it in the comments by the time we get to that point, right? Yeah. And we'll, we'll try to go through, a sp- particularly on final episodes of a series, yeah, and, yeah. and be, engage with you and write back and things like that. We can't always do that. I don't always have time. Um, also, there's... There's a taxing element to reading all the comments on a video mm. and seeing negative feedback and yeah. that just sticks with you. We'd love to, yeah. And yeah. as much as I wish I was capable of just letting that like fly <laughs> yeah. off my shoulder, I tend to get a little hot and argue with people and that's a yeah. huge waste of time. So sometimes yeah. I just avoid the comments for that reason. But on final episodes, on final mm. episodes, Kaysen and I will yeah. try to look at those and answer your questions. So... If you have questions, even though we're ahead, you can always write them in the in the comments, and we'll get, we'll try to get to them. Cool. Uh, but there's a bunch of people who liked that, 
and a bunch of people, okay. a couple of people who responded and say, yeah, I'd like to, you know, add that I, I want an answer to this kind of thing. So hopefully that's sufficient. Um, anyway, let's go to this one. What would you change to make the combat experience more balanced and or more enjoyable? For tactics? Yeah. Mm. Similarly, there are numerous rebalanced mods and hacks that presently exist. Which is your favorite? I haven't I've, played any. I haven't either. And I don't, I don't really get into them much. Me neither. Like, there's lots the mods of, and stuff. There's yeah. lots of like, oh, Final Fantasy VII rebalancing mod that makes yeah. the game you know, more challenging. I've never felt compelled to do that. I remember the one FF7 mod that I remember you even really playing ever <laughs> yeah. was the one where they changed the 3D models. Yeah, they just changed Cloud it to the battle Zifa. models instead yeah. of the... And I don't know that you played the whole game that way. I but did, you, you at least tried but I will out. never do it again yeah. because I do think it takes away something of the game's yeah. spirit. Sure, I do sure. think that the little chibi dudes were purposeful yes. and that they serve they a purpose. They blend in with the art in a, in a way that was intentional. Yeah. Yeah. I, I no longer believe Cloud as you see him say in Final Fantasy VII Remake, just this mm. immaculate, yes. like proportioned <laughs> yeah. uh, character uh, yeah. was sort of the intention of that game. And, okay. um, so I, I like to just play it normally. Gotcha. But what would I do to make more balance? I mean, I, I don't know if I would mm. because like we said, there can be joy in the breaking and exploitation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, some other people will probably have maybe good responses to this in the comments where they were like, yeah. oh, I would change this or that. I you would know, just I would just change, I would work to change the slope of difficulty. I would make the beginning of the game easier than it is. Mm, okay. Um, and get rid of the scaling system where the enemies yes, scale. Yes, yes, just get rid of that. I get why games tried to do it. Just stop, though, because, well, and they kind of did. They don't really do it as much anymore, but... That was bad in the PS1 era. Yeah. That was not good. And and get rid of that, but especially so that even late in the game you can keep recruiting people. And Yes. I don't know. We haven't even talked about that yet because there's not a whole really. bunch of <laughs> secret characters you can recruit, like Cloud Strife and Beowulf. And mm. um, in War of the Lions you can get uh, Balthier from Final Fantasy XII. Oh, there's a Final Fantasy nice. Tactics Advance character you yeah, can get. Yeah, we didn't get. talk about any of that. Um, Aerith is in this game. I don't want to focus on those things. There are some things that people say yeah. like, oh, you forgot to talk about this. And sometimes forgot when I Forgot may not be the right word. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it's not about forgetting. It's about not feeling it's relevant to what our podcast yeah. explores. We're, we're much more story oriented. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, that's another thing I just remembered. That was one of the most common comments I saw on the episode three uh, video we put up was, Oh, the, the choices, those like choices you can make before battles, they mm. do affect certain things in that it changes the objective of the battle or it okay. will reward you with bravery if you choose this instead of this. Yes, yeah, those and things. And so yeah. I wanted to clarify, like I was aware of all that. I did not mean it doesn't affect anything in the sense that it doesn't affect the game. It doesn't affect the story, yes. which is what we're talking about. That's <laughs> more, more what we're doing, yeah. It doesn't change what happens in the cutscene following yes. or anything else. Yeah. It only affects, sure, if I choose not to save Algus, then it doesn't get a game over if he gets taken out, right? Right. Uh, it'll, so it changes the objective, and but you won't get the bravery points, mm. right? I, I get that side of it. So we weren't many, meaning to insinuate it changes absolutely nothing whatsoever just that it doesn't have any effect on the story of the game, which is what we are focusing on here. Yeah. So a lot of these side quests and other things we could go over, it's like it's there. Uh, Cloud Strife comes from a dimensional rift into the world <laughs> of Final Fantasy Tactics, and Aerith is there, mm. and it's like he, canonically he would have been in the live stream at this time. Story <laughs> So it's like he when he went to story into the wise stream, that stuff's just irrelevant. It's just silly. It's just irrelevant. And it's it's a it's a yeah. funny cameo. It's not like no. I hate it. It's yeah, not like it's I not a bad thing. But we we can it, ignore it. It doesn't contribute to the theme. Yeah, the theme. So <laughs> I don't care about talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm with you. So, anyways, in terms of what to do differently, though, I'd say um, honestly, I played Project Tri Triangle Strategy, and um, I have very little to say negative about the way that the battles went in that game. So honestly, if you could keep the story and cutscenes of Final Fantasy Tactics, but throw in the triangle strategy gameplay, maybe that there would you go. be more balanced or Just, something. Just I think that would 
offer you an experience that feels That game's that coming up really, really soon. Is it's, it? It's like the first week of February it comes Oh, out. no way. So we should probably cover that to some extent oh, in a video. I should. So I should. Something to keep in mind. Maybe that's coming. Um, okay, cool. Very uh, story-oriented, very text-heavy. Uh, Robbie Huang, quick thoughts on Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, if you guys have played it. Mike has. I have, I have not. not oh, actually. you haven't. Okay, my brother's played it. <laughs> Your brother's played it. Yeah. I have like not played them. I own them both, but I have not played either. And it's They're, because it's, it's a different game. Story from the storytelling perspective, it is not Final Fantasy Tactics. It's a very different yeah. feel and very different style to it. That. Um, I've never felt like super compelled, like, oh man, I really want to sit down and play Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to have played it so that I can say, yes, so I've that played you can it. Mention it, right? Yeah. yeah. So or I can understand the context to, yeah. of the tactics series, yeah. but not because I'm actually that interested in it. Okay. He says he was really disappointed at the time, but it's grown on him massively in oh, the intervening okay. years. The story is really interesting upon revisiting it. Well, that's interesting. So that gives me some. It increases my uh, interest a little interest. bit, but um, we'll see what happens. Uh, maybe it can go on another State of the Art sequels podcast of the future kind of thing, right? Sure. It's for people to vote on. Okay, this one comes from Cosmic Crown. Do you think that a Final Fantasy Tactics game could work in another setting outside of Ivalice? I'm going oh, through Final course. Fantasy VIII at the moment, so the mm. cross wires in my brain got me thinking about the elements within the game setting that could work for a familiar style game, albeit one that might not, uh, might not be popular with most people it initially is presented to them. Okay, so um, yeah. I just, just just reminded me. We, just, we were just talking about triangle strategy. Yes. There are at least two maps that they have shown in triangle strategy that are Final Fantasy Tactics maps. They oh, really? They have the, the Zirakel Falls, there is really? a map in there is a map that they show in the trailer, the, no one of the recent way. trailers of tri a triangle strategy that is that exact map. Oh, sick! Also, hmm. there's one that's very eerily similar. You remember the map at the castle after Ramza talks to um, Zalbag and he tells him to go away, and he comes out and he's confronted by one of the confessors who's come to arrest him. Yes, yes. They have that battle in front of the castle with in Alma. In front of with Alma, yeah, yeah. That castle is also a map. It appears. Really? In triangle strategy. Wow, that's so fascinating. So triangle strategy is the answer to the question, I think. A Final Fantasy Tactics... Oh, but I guess you're saying a game in the Tactics series, which doesn't take place in Ivalice. That takes place somewhere else, like, F, like FF8 world. Like using FF8's world, but calling it Final Fantasy Tactics. I don't see why it can't. If Mario Rabbids can like be a fun game in the tactical vein... Then sure. you can you can basically do it wherever you want. I suppose I'd be open to it. Yeah, you would have to um, tell a very different story, <laughs> but here's, it can work. Here's the reason why I'm not necessarily open to them doing like revisiting another Final Fantasy world and telling a new story in that world. And this is going to sound elitist, and I'm not yeah, trying it's to not be what FF's about. I'm not trying to be elitist, but. Yeah. This was, from the beginning, something Sakaguchi was adamant about. Yeah. That each story be self-contained and that you don't make a direct sequel. He hates direct mm. sequels. He never wanted Final Fantasy to be that. He wanted it to be a new world and a new setting and to approach it as if that's the last game you'll ever make, well, which is why it's called Final Fantasy in part. Yeah. Um, he got away with it for like 10, 10 games. So. Yeah, and so it's like some people, it's always so funny to me how mm. people will tweet at him and say, when, when will you make Last Story 2 or Lost Odyssey 2? And it's like, so you don't do know who you're talking to. people know who you're talking to? <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. There's no chance That's he would so do funny. that. Anyways, Last Story 2. I would rather that if they were going to do a Final Fantasy Tactics game outside of Ivalice, that it just be some new world. Something yeah. like Triangle Strategy. Sure, uh, that yeah, would be yeah, a better... Yeah. Just make Triangle Strategy, just retitle it Final Fantasy FFT. Tactics with some subtitle, and I would be yeah, happy yeah. with that. That's what it should be. Well, FF <laughs> Triangle Tactics. <laughs> FFTT. Uh, Tom uh, Whitley here. Did you both enjoy the cutscenes more in War of the Lions or the PS1 version? He says, I prefer the PS1 version, but I'd rather have the writing from the War of the Lions. Also, what um, are your favorite classes? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I liked 
the cutscenes and War of the Lions better. Um, yep. I don't. I loved the voice acting. I really did. It was it was quite good. But sometimes it wasn't always so perfect. And I just I think my, I have my expectations a little too high when it mm. comes to in game dialogue, especially because they're typically not recorded anywhere near each other. And yeah. so sometimes it, they, while they're giving great individual performances, they don't, their lines don't sound much like they're actually talking to each other. This is especially true when one character is supposed to cut off another character yes. in the middle of their sentence. They, and there's always like this long pause. It's not real <laughs> But enough. it doesn't feel good. It right? doesn't feel good. And War of the Lions has a little bit of that. Um, but that being said, I, I love the War of the Lions cutscenes a lot. And so I would probably have to say that. Um, yeah. Here's... Here's one the thing I, in I have one forgotten too. now, I think on three occasions to bring up. I don't know why. It's in my notes every time and I always forget to bring it up. Mm. There is a one really weird stylistic choice that is in every single War of the Lions new cutscene. Oh yeah? They will um, build up to the line in the scene that is like the climactic, important like line of the scene. Yeah. And they will cut to black yes, as that to black. line I've is said. That. I've noticed that. And then it will fade back in back and they in. finish the scene. This yeah, that's weird. drives me crazy a little, a little bit weird. as a filmmaker. Yeah. As a former filmmaker, an I guess. Editor. An yeah. editor. Uh, <laughs> and it's something I criticized um, Final Fantasy XV's uh, movie Kingsglaive about. Oh, yeah. They did it in Kingsglaive uh, yep. several times. And yep. I was like, dude, yep. what the fetch do they keep doing this for? Now, I, in Kingsglaive, it was more egregious than it is in this game. Because at least in this game, I understand like the, the, the stylistic purpose of it. They are building up to a line of dialogue that they want to really be impactful and they take everything away so that you're just seeing the text and you're just focusing on the line being said yeah. without anything else. And it's just like, here it is, the thing you're supposed to take away from the scene. I get it. There's gotta be another way to do it. I that. don't <laughs> like it because it yeah. feels, it has a sense of finality to it. Yes. And, and then it when, it makes, back, when it comes back, it's anticlimactic. Back and it's, it feels yeah. anticlimactic. It's like, yeah. oh, the rest of the, what importance does the rest of this I know. have? Yeah. Are you just wasting my time now? I don't like that stylistic choice. Yeah. And it's in every single one of these redone Final Fantasy oh, War Lines cutscenes. Every one of them does it. Hmm. I don't like that element, but everything else about them I like better. Yeah. I like the writing better. I like the animation. I think the voice acting is very fitting. Mm. They do a pretty good job with it. Um, the, the cinematography adds to the storytelling. Yes, actually, very much so. It's really, really nice. It's creative, the, yeah. Other, other than that one thing I don't yeah, like that yeah. they do. <laughs> um, favorite class? Oh, yeah. I like, I like thieves <laughs> and monks, man. Monks are I, really good I got to <laughs> tell you, though, I was disappointed in the archers. Yeah. I didn't know, I didn't know that going <laughs> into this game. They're a good first chapter class. Yeah, but not a very good class. It's slowly, after. and I put a lot into those guys, so that was actually mm. pretty disappointing. Um, yeah, because I I just love like Legolas and <laughs> the the great bowmasters of 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 yore. But this game uh, doesn't really agree with me on that. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, it's it's a good first chapter class. Yeah, because it, it can be very specific. The range specifically is nice. useful in Zeekton and in Dorder, oh, where they have these really yes, high places the you can get stuff. up to and shoot really far. Yeah. But outside of that, it's not the best. Well, place. once you get everyone else, you know, up to a higher class, then the archers—it's just they aren't useful anymore. Like it's annoying. I don't yeah. like it. Um, I would say monk, probably my favorite class. In yeah, there. monks are sick. Okay, this one comes from Neil. Don't know if you will talk about it in a future episode, but how much do you believe the Hundred Years War and the War of the Roses inspired the setting of the game since they share a lot of similarities? Right, we talked about There's, that in the first episode. Those, right? those wars influenced a lot of fantasy fiction from around this time. Like mm. they, they really inspired um, uh, Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones oh, as well. Yeah. Okay. I've also noticed that a lot of these fantasy settings will have a country that's divided that used to be like seven kingdoms. Oh yeah. Kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, and that they like they reunited, but there's this like potential of them kind of doing their own thing again. Anyways, that's kind of Ireland. Ireland had seven kingdoms, right? And I think Rome was seven. Well, anyways, that was on seven mountains, but whatever. I am not terribly familiar with the history of the Hundred Years War or the War of the Lions. I've not like read into those wars and studied them. 
-hmm. So I can't point to anything in particular and say, oh yeah, like, but I've heard these things from people and I take their word for it. Um, seems to be the case that if you're gonna write a wartime story about yeah. like a, a medieval Western European setting, those are probably good places to go to mm. like learn about how those societies worked yeah. and how they fought their wars and things like that. And that will probably bleed into some inspiration of how you write your story. So probably had a lot of inspiration from that. Well, especially in Japan, um, I don't know, they, they, if you're wanting to tell a Western story but you didn't grow up in a Western tradition, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to go somewhere for some help yeah. on, on how to pattern your story. So yeah. I feel like if you've been fed stories like that your whole life and you know, you might be able to just off the cuff come up with a decent medieval tale. Yeah. But when you're not in that tradition at all, but you find it fascinating, you, you've got to find another way to educate yourself on it. Yeah. Okay, so anyways, this is kind of a <clears throat> continuation of a, a conversation we've been having in private messages on okay. Patreon. Um, it'll be interesting to get your opinion on this. So he, Sadistic Silver says, Mike has mentioned how modern JRPGs sometimes seem slow and tedious to him. How would you respond to the criticism that Final Fantasy Tactics and the other e-release games like FF12 and Vagrant Story are perhaps too fast-paced. While I do enjoy them and find their universe fascinating, there are many things that make Final Fantasy Tactics and the others hard to follow. The very similar character designs and names, the seemingly countless characters, groups and locations referenced in rapid succession of scenes, names to which the player has no relation or only gets it much later. To me, this sort of storytelling comes off as a bit aloof or somehow distancing for the player. It is a matter of thorough, is, is it a matter of thorough manual study? Sure, FF Tactics is written in a very writerly and tightly edited way, but do you really think this fast-paced formula is well suited for any type of RPG? For context, games like Persona or Trails might have slower plots and dialogue but are to me a bit more merciful or gamerly in the sense of grounding the player in their setting and day-to-day -day details by having other concerns than merely the rapid forward, uh, forwarding of plot and dialogue. My question uh, concerns primarily Final Fantasy Tactics and Ivalice though. I'm interested in each of your opinion as I feel Kaysen might have a slightly different perspective. Hmm. So, um I'll let you go first. I don't totally, I don't totally agree. I, I see where, I see where. I see where he's coming from. He's coming from for yeah. sure. But at the same time, like I mentioned towards, uh, well, in this episode here, I mentioned that there's just a couple too many characters in this game. Yeah. Um, that may be also be true of names and places and locations and things like where it's like this area and this region and this, these, you know, people outside of the country and within it. Um, you do get a lot of it. Uh, but I never felt too pressured to learn about all of that stuff too much. Mm -hmm. So the game will introduce things, and I found it immersive, and I, I didn't feel much pressure of like, oh, darn it, where is this? Oh, they mentioned a city. I don't know where that city is. What's going on? I need to go look it up. I never really felt the need to look it up. Sure. And it's partly because of the straightforward nature of the gameplay. Yeah. You never really, you never get lost in the game and don't know where to go. Yeah. Right? Oh, sure. You're a little dot, <laughs> and there's only a couple technical places to and go. And they put red nodes and on it's the very ones that you obvious need to go to next. Where you go next. So it's like, yeah. hey, if my, my thinking is, if I'm playing an immersive game, like if I'm playing Persona, and they're throwing names at me, and I can go wherever I want, that's rough. Like, I, I, need, I need a little bit more help. Um, and Persona, I like Persona, actually. I like those games a lot. Um, but as it relates to this game, the gameplay is so simple that having that complexity within the text of locations and characters and all of this stuff, um, I found immersive. And I did not worry too much about whether or not I understood exactly where everything was, and sometimes even who everything was. Sometimes they brought up names of people I didn't know who they were, but I didn't let it worry me too much because I, I understood that through the flow of the game, it was going to be revealed, and I wasn't too concerned about it. And it wasn't telling me, go to this place, and like, oh, dang it, what place? Where is that again? It's like, no, I know where it is. It's the next place. I'm just going to go along the game. I didn't have to worry mm. about 
understand whether or not my comprehension and my spatial recognition and my um, understanding of the characters, all their different relationships with each other, it didn't. Um, it wasn't so super important. Yeah. And that, that's a, a part of, and part a factor of the more simplistic gameplay. Not referring to the battles as simplistic, mostly just the traversing, right? The map and everything. Sure. Very simple, very straightforward. Never really an issue for me. Sure. Um, so that would probably be my response to that. Yeah. I, I, because I was doing the podcast and because I felt maybe some sort of pressure mm. to understand it very, very well. Right. <laughs> um, You're pouring over old maps. I went through a lot of things that I might not typically do yeah. on a normal playthrough of a game okay. to like say, explain what the 50 years war was all about. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. I don't think I ever really read into 50 years war on any other playthrough and had no idea what the neighboring <laughs> kingdoms were or like what, yeah. I just kind of like just went with the flow and it's like if I right. didn't get it, it was like whatever. I'll just kind of follow the main thread and it, I, I'll more or less know what's going more on. More or less right? how I was then. That and I, I think about. that approach will not leave you feeling like completely confused by the end of the game. No, you eventually get those gaps filled yeah, in. Yeah, and the story is about yeah. what did you get in all of this, Ramza? It's anyways, thematic, yeah. It's, the names and all of that is yeah, peripheral yeah. Mm -hmm. in the goal of the story. And the goal of the story is achieved if you know at least who Ramza and Delito are. <laughs> you you <laughs> at least have to story, know them too. Right? That's really kind of the core of it anyways. Yeah. So I think that those peripheral details in this case are not anything close to necessary to be able to follow the story of yes. Final Fantasy Tactics. Though I, I do sympathize mm -hmm. with the lots of names and rapid succession criticism yeah. because it's a criticism I share. Yeah. Not only of this game, but of a lot of fantasy epic uh, settings and stories. Yeah. It's like, here we go. You made strap up in, yeah. pull up the map. <laughs> pull up a, this is this, this is this, this is yeah. this. Get your Excel spreadsheet Now, out. I'm used to doing this because I did it for Tolkien and I loved yeah, yeah. doing it Me for too. Tolkien. Me too. I enjoyed that process for yeah. the Silmarillion. It was immersive. A lot of other people who read the Silmarillion don't like it because they don't want to do all of that work to yeah. understand where they are. Where yes. are the characters right now? Where is this in yeah, relation yeah. to this? Where is this? See, that's where The Hobbit was so good because you know yes. Hobbiton and then the Lonely Mountain and they're <laughs> only ever traveling one direction, direction the yeah. entire time mm -hmm. until they get there. And then you go back. And it's like, whereas the Silmarillion, it's here to here to here to here to here. Yeah, and it's, it's like, kind of like this game in some ways, but it's like, it's everywhere. Yeah. And that's really tough to, so to deal with. I think that that's a very fair thing to bring yeah. up as a, as a criticism to this no, game. It's, it's kind of hard to follow all the names and all the people and all the places. I don't think it's just an exclusive criticism to this game though. I think any sort of really high fantasy setting with a very complex and large world mm -hmm. has those problems in trying to explain a whole world's worth of details to yeah. somebody who was not born and raised like Ramza was in that world and learned all about it. Mm. Um, so that is a problem I would rather have personally mm. than feeling like I'm going to scream because the characters will not shut the fetch up repeating the same about things over and over and over and over again. Stuff, yeah. That is my personal bias in this conversation. Mm. I have no tolerance for ostentatious, repetitive dialogue. Right. It drives me up a freaking wall. Yes. It, so it, Honestly, with more concise dialogue like this that's not repetitive, it makes you value the dialogue more. Yes. Right. So when you're reading dialogue, you're zoned in. Whereas other games where clearly they're a little more loose with the rules on what people are yes. gonna say and all that stuff. Like what you're talking about where it's more repetitive, you tend to kind of tune it out a little bit. Yes. You tend to not pay as much attention. And that I gives start, you the, it trains you to do that's that. That's exactly what it, it does. It trains you to be like that. That's, so, I'm so glad you said that. That, that <laughs> so clarifies my point. In a game like Persona or Trails in the Sky or something like that. I think the Tales of games are a little like that. And Tales of games. Yeah. And a lot of contemporary modern JRPG yes. style writing. That are good games. I'm not saying they're yeah. bad games <laughs> at all. I'm saying that I have a personal taste issue with this mm. style of writing, which is that when dialogue of this kind is going on and on and on, I zone out and mm. I miss information. 
I lose yeah. out on it because I'm just like, okay, you've said this already three times. Eh, come on, when is it yeah. over? This is what I'm thinking, and so I start to miss yes. things. Now, these people will say, oh, all this dialogue adds greater context to the world and Character fills out the characters. Stuff, yeah. I don't agree with that entirely, but I see the perspective of it. Yeah. I am not, okay, let's say this. I, I've, I've been on record of saying I prefer games that are 20 hours long or less. I like short games, right? Mm. And this game is falls into that category. You can beat it fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, and in, it's very concise in how it delivers its story. And I really love that style of writing. I've been all over that. But I'm not against the idea of an RPG being 100 hours, just on right. its own. The problem is that in most cases, it's fluffed out to mm -hmm. 100 mm -hmm. hours, making you do a bunch of stuff repetitively, or yeah. people talking forever without the need to use that many words, and it just creates a 100-hour game when it's really only 20 solid, unique yeah. hours of content in it, and they just bloat it beyond belief. That's what I don't like. Yeah. But I would be totally on board for a game that actually justifies 100 hours sure. of content. I've played several, there are several games that I've played for over 100 hours. Yeah. Witcher 3 would be one of sure. these games for me. I adore Splatoon. it. Splatoon. I've, I've played <laughs> Splatoon for over 100 hours, man. The Witcher 3 is a very long game. Yeah. And it does not have the style of writing I'm talking about. It has way more writing than this game does. It's yeah. not as fast. It goes a little slower. So this is actually probably a good way to elucidate my, the difference for me. It's mm. not that I'm against a long experience or I'm against more words. The word count in The Witcher 3 has got to be astronomically higher than to Final tactics. Fantasy Tactics oh, and absolutely. probably more in line <laughs> yeah. with something like Persona sure. or Trails in the Sky or something like that. Right. The word counts are probably somewhere in the same ballpark. Sure. They don't use it here in the same way as here. And this is the really best example I can bring up. I have to also say, just so I'm putting it out there, I haven't actually finished playing Persona 4 okay, right. or a Trails game. I played Trails of Cold Steel for about 10 hours. I played Persona 4 on five occasions for four hours and I never get past a certain point. And the point that I, I always struggle on I get past this point, but this is where it starts to really eat at me. Yeah. When Yosuke and the main character go through the TV and what's-her-name uh, is holding the rope, but it gets um, like severed, oh. and, yeah, yeah. and she's like, oh no, how will they get out, right? And you yeah. go in there and Teddy approaches Teddy, you yes, to talk yes. to you. This conversation is essentially the same sentiment repeated like uh, just over and over and over mm. again. The, I think like I counted. Fatiguing. I counted the number of minutes at a leisurely, normal speed of reading yeah. to get through this scene, and it's like ten minutes long of them distrusting each other mm -hmm. and saying it again and again and again and again and again. Oh, you! What are you doing here? You guys are the killers. No, I'm not the killer. What are you talking about, man? Uh, what are you? Who are you? You're just suspicious. Uh, no, I'm not. I live here. Uh, you, why are you? Why are you do? What are you doing here? You guys are suspicious. Are you the killers? No, man, I'm not the killer. That's literally the conversation for ten freaking minutes straight. They won't stop repeating the same thing. <laughs> it drives me crazy. And that's that's what persona is. <laughs> Stop talking about the same thing, dude. Move on. Move on. You do not have oh to do God. that to fill in the world or to yeah. make the characters Oof. be more fleshed out. That's not what that dialogue is doing. Yeah. It's superfluous. It's 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 just fluff. Yes. And this is what I don't like yeah. about that style of writing. <laughs> The Witcher 3 does not do that, yeah. but it has 60 to 100 hours of earned content in it that is yeah. not fluff, that actually fills in the world and actually gives depth to the characters and actually does what these people are claiming this do. Now, that was a very impassioned rant <laughs> that I just did. Yes, and indeed. I it will seem as if I am very close-minded about it because of the passion with which I delivered that. 
I promise you, uh, it's not that way. I am willing to have, I am willing to have a uh, fair, um, like good faith conversation to show me I'm wrong about that if that's the case for the rest of those games which I have not bothered to play because their right. style of dialogue drives me absolutely crazy and I couldn't right. take it after a certain length of time. Um, there could be other things if it's like, please just like, feel free to go through it faster, but just get to these parts of it. This is what you'll like. I'm totally open to mm -hmm. having a discussion about this, right? But okay. that's why I don't think these are comparable necessarily. <laughs> and my problem is not with grounding the player with more simulation aspects and more like slice of life, day to day, sort of mundane, mun, what's the? Mundane words. Is there like a plural form of like mun? Mundanity, mun no, no. What's the word I'm looking for? Anyways, mundane Tedious. elements. Mm, yeah, yeah. As long as they are contributing to the theme, right. they are working towards that, right? Always working at that. In Persona, I think they actually do. Okay. In general, just just talking about the idea of persona in a Jungian sense, sure, and how your your day to day life is contributing to the persona, sure, um, to the mask that you wear that is separate sure. from who you really are, you know. Yeah, I don't know that that's the most interesting thing to be doing when you could be fighting monsters, but I actually love the persona games in part because of the mundane aspect. Yes, you got to find which girl you want to date. Sure, and go to your gym class. And sure, it's so fun. Uh, I think that that's a really fair point. Yeah, and that actually gets me thinking. Oh, because we just did Xenogears. And like yeah. the whole study of Jung that we did there, yeah, leads Persona me Five wants yeah. to pursue anything Jungian and other yes. stuff just to yeah, see yeah. how they implemented. Well, there. Persona's all about Jung in, in certain ways, but at least to that end, it is. Yeah. So like, uh, I was recently going through uh, Eternal Darkness, Sanity's oh, Requiem dude. again, and yeah. her grandfather was a psychologist. Yeah. Uh, and oh. He brings up Jung and other because no he was a contemporary of them. And That's so he right. brings up, I wonder what Jung would think of this and his Dude, it's theory been of uh, the uh, collective unconscious no would, be an, uh, would be affected if he knew that this was going on. So I, so I found funny. that fascinating. I was like, oh, nice. Sick. So <laughs> knowing now yeah. Jung's theories and, and his archetypes, yeah. uh, perhaps another crack at Persona would be an interesting thing to explore. I would probably rather try five yeah, than four yeah. Again. if you've played four or five times, <laughs> we should probably go with five because I really like five. Now I say all of this too with the knowledge that it's almost a certainty that on this podcast we will cover a game like Persona or I think Trails so. in At the some Sky because as far as RPGs go, At like some that's point. high level. Yeah, it's going to happen, yeah. and I'm a f terribly afraid of disappointing people by being super <laughs> negative on those games. Like I, I'm literally fearful of it. Yeah, but. Uh, I don't. Th I think it would be a disservice to not at least take a look at it. I think yeah. you have a higher tolerance, maybe for for sure, dude. Those styles. Uh, part of, of it's the nostalgia effect, though, because Persona sure. Five. <laughs> <laughs> How long are we going to talk about Persona? Okay, I don't know. Persona Five is set in a place in Tokyo that I've been to before. I've yeah. been there, and I've been to the station, and there's the statue of the dog, the the little um, dog that. Uh, Hachiko, Hachiko, and you can see that statue when you go out, and in, the game is set in actual, yeah. like real life Japan, Tokyo, you know, and so that just gets my nostalgia going like crazy. So right. I'd have a hard time being objective with Persona Five, sure. but it's I th I think it's a great game. I do think <laughs> that that's cool though, like yeah, and I love the style, like the menus and the effects and oh yeah, like the 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 UI, the sort of like um. Like the jazzy style to yeah, all of it. Yeah, yeah. Like I freaking love that. And yeah. so like every time I look at a trailer or something, it's like I should like this. Yeah. And then I play Persona Four, and it's just like, dude, I can't. Anyways, I've already said that. All right, What's that's that? enough. Two, three, well, we'll do. A, we'll do we like got, one we or have, two we more. We got ten minutes or so. Um. Is there a particular franchise you would like to see get the tactics treatment for a game? Like another series that would get a tactical RPG treatment? I don't know. Um, that's a good question. Like, I know what you said about FF games not ever having any sequels, mm -hmm. but if you were going to take a game like FF7 and give it a tactical type treatment, <laughs> it would be sweet if you did the prequel like a way in the past with the ancients and stuff. Oh, sure. Right? 
You know that there's a first soldier. Um, I know of that Fortnite style Final oh Fantasy gosh. VII game, right? No, I do know. I do know of that. But yeah, <laughs> I'm talking way back. I'm talking <laughs> okay. ancients and back in the days of the first calamity, kind of thing. You know. Um, that's a really hard question that I'm really struggling to like have something pop into my mind where I feel for sure like that's the one. Because um, it's usually best fitted for um, wartime stories, right? Yeah. And so I mean, you've got like um, Advanced Wars, which is like more modern, but for the most part, it's like medieval. That's what they tend to do. I can't, I can't come up with an answer right now. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. I have to think really hard about that. Witcher. Just say The Witcher. Um, the, the Witcher could work, actually. <laughs> um, we've already answered this one, I Kay. think, sufficiently in, in the two episodes. The, Ma- the Malgador? Malgador? I'm curious as to what uh, some of your favorite combat encounters were and why they stood out to you. Also, what do you think of the decision to have Sid be so powerful? I think we answered that one already. Yeah, we talked about that one a bit. I imagine a lot of games would have had him just be an average playable character or just let him be as a a temporary guest. But I personally love the boldness of the dev team to have him join your party and uh, live up to the hype. It's interesting because Fire Emblem games have a trope where they kind of do the opposite. Yeah. They give you a super overpowered character in the opening of the game, mm. and like that's a character you lean on ah, as you're yeah, learning yeah. how to play the game. It's like all you guys are weak and they struggle, but There's this guy's strong. Can. But and eventually that's, that's you sort of... That's kind of a hook, too. It's like, well, that's sweet. I want to become like that guy. They don't end up leveling up as fast as everyone else, so the rest of them sort of outclass that character by the end oh, of the okay, game. Yeah. And I kind of like that approach. Mm-hmm. I don't, it wouldn't have worked in this game because Sid, his role in the story doesn't come up till late. Yeah, yeah. But it's almost the opposite. It's almost like they, you needed a Sid at the beginning of the game to help you through the, the, yeah. the, the rough going of the start. <clears throat> and that, that's the way Fire Emblem kind of, help, uh, kind of handles that. Um, as for my favorite combat encounters, um, we had a difference of opinion on this. Kukulain? Oh, Kukulain, yeah, yeah. The, I liked that battle. That was the first battle against a single enemy. Yeah, it yeah, was that's a, true. It was a Lukavi demon, and it was like the music was really like intense and a bit disturbing the music in its was nature. Great. And, and his character design is very disturbing. Yeah, it's a, I, I really liked that one. That was memorable for me mm-hmm. as the first Lukavi you fight. But of, of course, also like Wygraf, which is one of the hardest battles in the game at yeah. the Riovanes Castle late stage, because just because of how much you got to put into figuring out how to get past that part, because it's so hard. Mm-hmm. I, I I I really don't like the battle after that on the roof. That one's just cheap. But the Wygraf fight is tough in such a way that where it's like you got to dig deep and figure out yeah. like how this game works in order to win, and so. You'll lose a bunch probably in, in your first attempts, mm. but it's very rewarding to finally win that fight. I just like the story one specifically, like when we kill Algus and stuff, and like the ones that have more dialogue while you're fighting. Those are the philosophical battles taking place during the physical battles, and um, I, I just really appreciate that for story reasons. You actually hit on this one from Sig about st- you know, the map, uh, the overworld map. Okay. I think you did a pretty good job on that one. And we already answered one. Of um, so yeah, we've already gone with him a couple times. I'm going to have to respond to that one because we're going to have to watch a video. Okay. So I'll try to answer him. Uh, this is from Daniel Rodriguez. He's talking okay. about we'll Ovelia and Delita's relationship. So I'm mm-hmm. going to try to find just one more short one. What message does, what message does, does the story inculcate about how to live one's life? Leader and Ramza chose opposite paths. We already answered that. Yeah, that's a theme of the game, yeah. What is this? Okay, this is the last one from Ryan Gardner-Cook. I'm probably too late, but I've been wondering about this from Chapter 1. Why does Algus Argoth give Ramza the information needed to rescue Titra from Zeekdran Fortress? He thinks Delita and all commoners, including Titra, is beneath or are beneath notice and that Ramza is a fool for expending any effort to help, yet he gives them the information they need to mount a rescue. Algus Argoth is a tool, but this strikes me as a humanizing moment for him. Ramza has cast him out. He vehemently disagrees with Ramza's worldview, yet he helps. Do people buy this, or am I missing some detail, some way in which Algus Argoth benefits from this? 
The, the short answer is because the the game <laughs> the game <laughs> needed you to go there. Developers <laughs> needed you to go somewhere and needed you to know where to go and what to do and all that. That's the that's the reason. Um, but yeah, it does give him some human element. It seems like um, he is willing. You know, he does see you in some type of human light in some way or another. Yeah. Um, I think honestly, he's kind of doing it to wave it over your head, though. There's. Yeah, it's almost like, uh, I think there's two ways. I, I thought of two answers to this. One is that he is legitimately shocked when Ramza is like telling him he never wants to see him again. Uh, yeah. So he, he acts the way he does toward Delita. And he has probably the thinks attitude Ramza he has. will agree with him. And he's like, wait a minute, Ramza? Like, we're friends. He, I, he's like legitimately so surprised mm. that Ramza is this mad at him about it. And probably has is so confused about that that he feels like oh he'll probably come around right oh like, sure yes yes I think if he does I think keep that. being useful like he'll yeah. he'll see that I'm not his enemy kind of a right. thing right but also I, so I don't think he's doing it for the sake of Titra Delita he's doing it to try to just get Ramza to know like I I don't so want he did any, it for Ramza not Delita I don't have any animosity towards you and right. I don't know why you do towards me this doesn't make sense this is how yeah, the, yeah. the way the world works yep. Also, it could be hmm. that he wanted Ramza and Delita to be there when he shot, uh, when he shot Titra, mm. so he could make his point. I don't think that's true because he would have had. I think after I don't know how this, well it was planned. he would have had to go Zalbag's get favor with Zalbag group. afterward, yeah. and there would have been stuff off screen. So I see it. I see it more like he was just so sure, shocked sure, that, that. that Ramza was so mad at him. That he's just trying to do anything to, to let him know, like, I, we don't have to be enemies. Like, I don't really understand. And that's kind of the whole thing, going back to what um, Sakaguchi said about Matsuno's board, whiteboard, characters saying, like, they uh, can't understand each other. Yeah. This game is full of people who can't understand each other. And yeah. as, as much as Ramza can't understand um, Algus's point of view, Algus is similarly baffled by yeah. Ramza's. And just deleted. confused, yeah. like, yep. why are you mad at me? I thought we were friends. What's the what's the problem? Yeah, so. we both want to say we we both want to be rich, sipping margaritas on the beach, like rich nobles living the life. Right. What's your deal? Mm -hmm. and okay. It's like Ramza does not want what he wants. <laughs> Anyways, that's the end. Uh, we will try <sighs> to answer more of these questions uh, through text. Uh, questions in the comments through text. We'll check the comments. Um, please feel free to. Uh, you know, discuss anything you'd like down there or ask us any questions you have or uh, counterpoints you'd like to share. Um, this was a very fun series. Next week will be Love Hellblade, it. Senua's yes, Sacrifice. Yes, that's going to be great. It'll be the first time I've played that game. Yeah, so. it's going to be a one-off episode. Um, and then after that, we will be moving on to uh, we'll, another bigger podcast. We'll see. This one is totally undecided still yeah. at the time of recording this. It's like Nier Automata and Vagrant Story are completely neck and neck. Yeah. So we still have all the way till Friday before that's finished. So we'll announce that next time, what the next game's gonna be. Until then, thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Peace out. <laughs>